If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Ooh, you doing the takeover Pump. again? Oh, for the first 52 minutes of great conversations, we start off, Sal drop, drop some Amazing conversation. Right, great, right? And yeah. we have Amazon's Electric Dreams and the future of of TV. You gotta watch that show on Sal Amazon Sal compares Prime. it to Black Mirror. It was awesome. Which, I mean, uh, it's got big shoes to fill. That's and it. while we're on the Amazon topic, we get over the challenge, the changing world of retail, right? What's happening is is Amazon gonna Stores fuck everybody. are dying everywhere. In the butt. Right? Yes. Yeah, right. It's like a graveyard out there. Right? And then we get into the tooth-mounted tracker and wearables. Man, the future is here, you guys. Oh well, wait, my god. They're wait in our teeth. Justin, did you get the tooth tra- tracker? Is that what I happened? I did. Okay. I'm way above you guys. Uh, did you yeah. get those with the new I'm pearly advanced. whites? I'm almost like, uh, you know, an Android at this point. That was the uh, upgrade, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then we get into the new therapies for depression and PTSD. Huh? That's right. Nutritional therapies and uh, the magic mushroom. Right. The, you got into, yeah. You talked a little bit about the, the, the future degrees too, right? Now that it was psychology that did, didn't exist. What, Psychiatry, ten, yeah. yeah. Yeah, man. That's fucking- Adding some nutrition in the mix. About awesome. freaking time, right? And then uh, you brought up some Corey Feldman. Yeah, like I, we're still talking about this guy. He got to crap me out. He's 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 going after the freaking Hollywood grossness. Yeah, <laughs> fuck those guys. Right, and Evil I was excited bastards. about this one. Sal and I, when we were down uh, with Amanda Bucci, she dropped uh, the Uber for dogs. I think it's called Wags. Is that what it was, Doug? Wags mm. is the uh, is the app where I can have someone come walk my bull. Just as long as they don't walk them away, and you never see them again. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. A little caution there. Right. I think you'd be okay. Yeah. We, get, we get into that for a little bit. Yeah. And then we uh, wrap it up with um, my fixer-uppers, the type of women that I used to date. Oh, that's what it is. <laughs> and why I was drawn to them. So uh, if you want to The DIY. The first, right, uh, first 52 minutes of debacle. He likes to, and, and he likes to uh, yeah. invest in a fixer-upper, fix it up, and then put it on the market that's for more, for more <laughs> yeah. money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, build build I should it get, up for more that's value. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to all these motherfuckers. You're the house like, flipper. They get all dimes and great wives and kids now like, like hey man you owe me some for me like that was training ground that's with it. me here buddy that's it. it's like better luck right. chuck right right yeah. and then we get into the questions the first question that we get into is what's the quickest way to lose belly fat arriba, arriba. <laughs> <laughs> i want it off of me that's now a, that's right. a throwback to yeah. a little cartoon we had <laughs> ipa, ipa, andale, andale. Uh, right. we brought these yeah. up though because a lot awesome. of people ask you know we sometimes we go really deep into the weeds right we get crazy with some of the topics you that go dipping the weeds sure the, sir the average person just wants to know how the hell do i get this damn belly fat off me so we address some good points in that one that's a really good topic then we move over into what is the healthiest way to bulk what type of carbs should you consume? Like should we just eat a bunch of burgers like that dirty and big chicken buckets like Sal? Yeah, right. We sell, uh, Sal and I give some of our old school strategies that we do not recommend now for you. <laughs> then, we get it, then we get into a really long question for Doug. Doug loves when we have long questions for him to type out for us. A body positive intuitive eating advocate argued that it is not important that people know portion size or know how certain foods affect the body and mind. What are our thoughts on the extreme body positive Okay, advocates? too long. Yeah, right? That's yeah. What Sum saying. it up. Yeah. No, but I think this is a great topic, right? Who seem to encourage body acceptance with no regard to healthy habits. How do yeah. you see the health education fitting in, into intuitive eating? Mm. Good debate right here. Mm. Yeah. Right? Good debate. Great conversation. Make sure you listen to that one. And then the final question we wrap up. I'm an assistant fitness director at my club and am very passionate about what I do. My managers, on the other hand, aren't. My fitness director is very egotistical, very common, by the way, and only enjoys her title. My GM is unmotivated and isn't willing to do anything to improve our club. Our numbers are horrible, and my team hates it here. Sounds like the bad news bears. Mm. What steps can we take to change our numbers, staff attitude, and club future? Mm. Do you read the entire question, Sal? I feel uh, like you sum it up. No, I usually sum it up. He right. sums it up. It's okay. It's, okay. it's right. different. No, it's, 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 a new, it's a new thing. It's good. It's a yeah. new thing. It's, yeah. it's an Adam thing. It's a yeah, right. yeah. backup today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is, just in case. Yeah. Not bad off the cuff. You know, like, come yeah, on. It's like a, yeah, it's like hitting left-handed, you know? Yeah. Oh, right. hey, you which forgot I to mention. Which happen to be. Which you, you do, so it makes you, sense. You forgot to mention, Adam. You are a much better pitch man than I am. Yeah. So when to, you to, talk about, before we talk about what they get free this month, tell us what each program is for, Sal. Yes. Each pro- well, okay, so let's talk about the individual programs. Very quickly, 
You want to big build maximum muscle and size and strength, MAPS Anabolic. If you want to train like a functional athlete, that's MAPS Performance. If you are a stage presentation athlete, bodybuilder, physique competitor, bikini competitor, or you want to shape and sculpt your body in uh, specific and symmetrical ways, that's MAPS Aesthetic. If you like to work out at home without equipment or work out on the go, like you travel quite a bit, that's MAPS Anywhere. Or finally, if you want to correct muscle imbalances or help your body deal with pain, that's MAPS Prime and MAPS Prime Pro. Now, we do package a lot of these together in bundles. Now, bundles are two or more MAPS programs combined, usually with a mod, so we'll add an extra element to it to help you out, but also... We'll discount the price like 20 to 30% off on top of it. So you get a massive discount by combining things in bundles. And bundles are designed for specific goals. Well, this is the final day to take advantage of our free giveaway. Enroll in any of our bundles and you get forum access to free. That's our Mind Pump private forum. Easily our most valuable thing that we have to offer. Where there's lots of trainers on there, lots of fitness enthusiasts. Adam, Justin, and myself are on there on a, on a pretty regular basis, daily basis, answering questions and helping people out. You get that access for free if you enroll in any bundle. After today, this promotion will end and will probably not come back for a very, very long time. Final day. To enroll in any of these bundles and take advantage of this forum access, including the super bundle, which is a year of exercise Lance, programming. it's a money back guarantee. What are you waiting for? Yeah, you know, we don't mm. mention that that often. You could try any of our programs for 30 days and if, if it doesn't blow your mind, just take it, take it back. We'll refund you 100%. No problem. Um, this is the final day again. To get any of these programs or to get more information, go to mindpumpmedia.com. Are we Matt ready to had roll? a good idea. I wanted to steal. He is like, you should write like a bulk, bulking Bible. You know, like, is there, is there somebody, has, has that been done yet? Well, good job now, Justin. You just told everybody. Well, we didn't start yet. We could yeah, go, we're, we we're could recording Google that. Right I bet now. you somebody's got no. the bulking Bible. Somebody it's too, probably that's too easy, right? It's, I know. Well, that's what I said. Well, I got, I've never seen it, but I'm sure it exists. So, so uh, years ago, I read a book. Uh, fuck, what was the name of it? Oh, it was a diet, uh, and it was based off of the Bible. So it was like the... Wait, all you eat is manna? It was the... It was the <laughs> It was like you the, wait till it falls from the I sky. forgot what it was called. It was like the godly diet or something like that. And the author, you know, he's a theologian. Is that the right way to say it? Sure. He studied, you know, Christianity was a super Christian. And it, this is I read this book like eight years ago. Hmm. And in this book, he's like, all the answers to what you need to do for your body are in this, you know, super powerful book called the Bible. Now, I read this because I thought it was brilliant because there's enough people who are so dogmatic that they'll buy that because they'll be like, oh, right. that's what I need to do. This is the need... only place I live. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Great. So if we did a bulking Bible and we like we could open it up and be like, you know, Jesus gave thou us Thou shalt, <laughs> oh God, <laughs> yeah. thou shalt buy whey protein. Yeah. Playing with fire over there. I know, I know. <laughs> For sure yeah. go to hell over that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'll, when I'm dead, I'll be at the gates and I'll be locked. Like, what's going on? <laughs> Jesus will come out and be like, all right, Sal, uh, yeah. Here's all the good things you did. You did a lot of good stuff. You've misrepresented me. Yeah, but then you sold this book. Like, yeah. what do you, the <laughs> Bible? <laughs> you profiteering Bibli- off me? Biblical bulking? What is this all about? Yeah. Anyway, so you guys really enjoyed Black Mirror, right, on Netflix? Yeah, it's great. It's you guys creepy really like- as hell, and it's thought-provoking, and it's scary. It's like the modern-day Twilight Zone. I love the Twilight Zone as a kid. Yeah. That kind of writing where you're 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 watching a, sh- a show or a movie, and you're you're trying to figure out what's going on and it's compelling and you're guessing and guessing and you get fucked at the end. Like at the very end, you're just like, <laughs> wrong. Co- like, totally wrong. Not it, only- it challenges you though. Yes. That's it's, what I love about it's it. It's so wrong. You're so wrong that you're disturbed a- afterwards. You know what I mean? For like hours <laughs> afterwards, you're like, what? So like, you guys, why? Were, you guys were like game night. I just went and saw that in theater. Oh, is that good? Game yeah. Night. Yeah. Okay. It's very similar as that. Oh, so I'm about to tell you guys, hmm. I found another black mirror type show. Esque. Brand new. Mm. Brand new Amazon Prime. So, and it's fucking, I watched the first episode only, so I, I don't know about the rest of them. And they're, it's like Black Mirror. It's a bunch of different episodes. So two things. First off, awesome show. I watched the first episode and it, and it it twisted twice. So at the end, I was like, oh no, that's what's going on. And then again, I was wrong again. Like it fucked me up. But What's it called? You gotta give me the title. Uh, <laughs> Electric Dreams. Okay. <laughs> Electric Dreams. Electric so it's Dreams. all about, it's all, it's like Black Mirror. It's, it's like using technology to tell stories or, mm. or the twists and stuff. So the episode I watched in the beginning was this, this woman who 
uh, she's a police officer in the future. They have like flying cars, this, that, and the other. And her girlfriend is uh, works for this company that makes this device that you you put on your 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 temple, and it brings you to another world, so you can kind of help forget your problems for a little bit. So she does that, and then she awakens, and she's like, she she all of a sudden is this dude in this other world, can't figure anything out. It's really disturbing. And so she goes back and forth between these worlds. And the whole time you're like, wait a minute, which one is really her? Which one? Yeah. Dude, is she the guy or is she? You will not figure it out until like at the end, I'm like, get the fuck out of here. Totally blew me away. Wow. So good. But you know, what's cool about this is how did you find it? Who recommended this to you? I was on, so I've been going on, uh, so I canceled my, my dish network and all, you know, cable. Uh, we're life. about to cancel ours. It's a fucking waste of money. Unless you watch live mm. sports, right? That's the, pro- well, even then though, I was, last night I was watching the, the Warriors game and there's a NBC or I mean, excuse me, a Bay area sports app that I could stream my, if I just want to watch the, because okay. that's all I need the sports for. I don't need to watch every other team. Yes. So what's the best way to approach this? Because you need high speed internet, right? So like, it, is it, this still like Comcast is like your best option? There's like no. AT&T, there's Cancel like- Cancel all of them. Google, like- Cancel all of them. Wire, has that ex- does that exist yet? Get really, really good internet, whatever that is. Yeah, uh, and then where? And then just get, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yes. Comcast. That's right. what I'm saying. I do, like, yeah, I do you, Comcast. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then I have, I just have Hulu- Amazon Prime, Netflix, and YouTube. And yeah. to be honest with you, it's the move. It's everything. What does yeah. it come out? Okay, so but here's the thing: I watch a lot of Showtime too. Okay, so that's that makes it tough. Shout out to the fucking oh, yeah. billion started again, dude. Yes. I haven't watched it yet. So I haven't either. I won't okay. say it. All right, TiVo right now. So don't. that and Silicon Valley just started again too. Which oh, I'm, did that? Yes. Oh, good because I yeah, love both HBO. those shows. Those yeah, are both great like, shows. So, so here's my problem: I've got an HBO show, I got multiple HBO shows. Yeah. I got multiple Showtime shows. I watch sports. And and then you figure the uh, the internet price for high speed internet is fifty to sixty bucks minimum a month. So it, am I really going to save that much money if I now you got to get apps like HBO Go has an app but you got to pay to subscribe to that like right? 50, so. like thirty or fifty bucks a month so thirty something I think a month for HBO. Uh, if you get all that, I, I could see that it might equal out the same. Up, but yeah. that's think about it this way, like yeah, you know, so I could see the value if you find like HBO and Showtime and live sports because as of right now. There really isn't an answer to some of that stuff, right? But think about it this way: that's the only thing keeping you there. The second, I like, know. you have an option, you're you're gone. I could give a shit about cable, dude. Well, the, what's only really hanging me because I could, what I know, we could do and save money. And Katrina would do this. I wouldn't do this. This is where like companies get people like me. Is I would sign up for those things and just pay for the whole year and keep paying. And even though I'm not watching a show on it, but she'll be smart. She'll cancel it after a season. So if we're watching HBO and we're streaming HBO, which you can do. Yeah. And I'm paying top dollar or thirty something bucks Just a month. Watch it for that season. Yeah, watch it for that season. Then boom, cut it off. And then we're doing Showtime. And then uh, I, you know, where I think it's heading. I think it's gonna and eventually all a cart. Yep. Right? Like oh. every show is all a cart. It's gonna head that It'll way be because awesome. it's get, it's gonna get so competitive. Well, because, look how look how Apple's geared it. Yeah. Apple's geared it that way. It's like iTunes. I, point, I watch. Right? I pay, bro. They get me like crazy. My I, I have to check. I need to look and see what I'm up to a month. But there's a lot of shows that I just two ninety nine. I walk like I'm, oh yeah, I do that on Amazon. Like I, I went back and watched all the Modern Family, and I, you can watch oh, that free yeah. on regular te- television. But because I didn't catch any of it, and I'm going back and I'm streaming all of it, it's like two ninety nine to hit every single exactly. time. Exactly, and I'll go through a bunch. Dude, of Dude, it's gonna tonight. be it's gonna be like that because I'm watching. You know, I watch Electric Dreams. And I'm like, this is directly compare uh, competing with Black Mirror for Netflix. Yeah. So Netflix and Amazon are going to head to head. Hulu is going to start doing their own thing. YouTube is creating their own content. Right. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a war, which is great for the consumer because all that's going to do is increase the quality of the writing. It's going to bring in all the best actors, mm-hmm. and the pricing is just going to keep going down as they continue to fight. It's, it's just the way it is. It's still really weird to see like like major motion picture actors in like all these streaming shows now. <laughs> it's but it makes so much sense because like it's so cinematic, it's so epic. A lot of these shows, it's just a really long form mm-hmm. movie. Like mm-hmm. you get you get it in pieces now. And the writing, it's this is where they're this is where you're going to see people win. Is it, how good is their writing going to be? Right, mm-hmm. like Netflix so far has put out some incredible series with, that are just just for Netflix with really, really good writing. Obviously, that's what's kept HBO and Showtime alive exactly. is their good writing. Yep. Amazon now is having great writing. Like, this is going to be awesome. It's going to be so great. Anyway, you guys need to watch Electric Dreams. It's fucking... All right. It's I'm so... In. No, yeah. no. We'll, it's so good. You know, we'll along, along the lines of your talking about these big companies and Amazon, dude, is just... It blows my mind how much... 
these guys are just dominating and taking over and companies just you you submit you just have no choice but to submit to them i was reading this article on this company called pickleball paddler and it's a this guy created this this like um online sports equipment and it's for like retirees and mm. uh, pickleball paddles are some sport that i've never even seen before it's like an, it's like shuffleboard right it's like kind of like one of those sports right the but yeah. old people do right because it's doing your backyard. Yeah, it just take a lot of mobility and shit to do. <laughs> yeah. it. But there's, I guess, a huge need for these retirees to be able to buy th- these things. Well, this guy builds up this this company to make like three hundred thousand dollars, and I think it's in its first or second year, and he's making three hundred k. Well, then he decides to go on Amazon. Well, in Amazon, he turns around and he's making thirty three million dollars a year off <laughs> Amazon. But here's what? the shit crazy part though. He makes one million dollars out of the thirty-three million. Like the rest is eaten up in what Amazon makes off of it. And so, I mean, he's still making three times more well, than he was. So, that's my point. So it's like, what a crazy yeah. s- situation to be in for a, for a, a, a entrepreneur or a business owner like this. You just made three hundred k your first year. You start, you know, which is good. First couple of years of business. If you're doing that kind of revenue, mm-hmm. you've obviously proven the model that there's there's money mm-hmm. to be made here. And you have this opportunity, you start working with Amazon, then all of a sudden Amazon cranks you up to a $33 million company a year, but you're only making $1 million out of that. What I would do with that, you know what you do with that situation is you go in, you use Amazon so that you can get way more exposure, you make more money. In the meantime, you build a massive email list, an empire on your own. And when you figure you can generate more than a million dollars, pull the plug or at least set yourself up because here's the scary part. When you're doing that with Amazon, it takes them one or two moves to take you off their list or not show up in the searches. Pfft, business is gone. Well, that's what the scary. Super dependent. That's on what it. the scary part would be, right? Is yeah. that you know if Amazon all of a sudden decide like, eh, no, you're not going to cut it. We're going to double your fee or sorry or whatever. We're they not going to show you up in the search, top of the search. Right. Like just imagine all the leverage that they have on these businesses, and you you basically are kind of forced to do it. It's like, well, do I want to? Do I want to turn this thing into a $33 million well, company? In or? the past, here's yeah. a here's the thing. Now, we're talking about this and we're like, ah, oh, this sucks. But in the past, you know, you were at the the whim of retailers also. So, like, if you made a supplement, you know, in the 80s or 90s, let's say in the 90s, you make a good supplement and then GNC, GNC yeah. gets their hands on it. Now, sales go through the roof. Well, if GNC says, we don't want to carry your supplement anymore, right. you're fucked. So... I think you know the smart thing to do with this with this type of technology is take advantage of it, but set yourself up in case. Yeah, it literally shit hits is the, the fan. virtual version of you know like like showing it off in the store, like what kind of space and like visibility you're gonna get, and you know all that mm-hmm. stuff. So well, it kind all- of it kind of feels like a race to the bottom a little bit to me. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Where it's just like it's just cut price, cut price, cut price. It's everybody yep. is on this race of how cheap can you give away this stuff and of course well, it doesn't even make sense anymore to have a company that you're looking for other forms of shipping you know other than Amazon like, right Amazon really is is the best right now option I can't I mean self-driving you know automated cars and all that stuff that's going to make shipping so that'll be the first place I think it will get dominated by that kind of technology yeah. we'll be shipping I think for well you sure. see to- I mean it's it's kind of crazy to see just Toys R Us like evaporating <laughs> you know, like I, I went there, dude. They were and a it was monster. like fifty percent off, you know, because it's 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 a closeout. Oh, did like, you go? Yeah, I went with my son. I was like, oh, dude, let's go get some Legos, you know, while <laughs> while they're still there. And uh, it, it was just kind of depressing, you know. It's like it's just another it's Their another childhood. pillar that just fell, you know. That was an untouchable brand, not like twenty years ago. Oh, yeah, it's the experience too, because like a lot of toy stores have been um, absorbed by by I guess this financial company that kind of came in, and then it just kind of destroyed uh, what it was. But um, yeah, like that whole experience, I think I wonder how it, much it'll gonna- be resurrected. I'm sure some company will come back and create some cool, ex- like you know, like a storefront where you go in and the kids like, you know, play with everything they look at. Cause it's like, that's such a part. That's a, that's a connection there that, you know, kids really, I mean, it, it benefits the kids and the parents too at the same time. You make a great point. I I think you're in order to compete, you're going to have to make a retail space. That's a, an experience, like something you want to go to. Yeah. Otherwise there's no way you can. I could see if I was somebody trying to compete with that, I would take like the, 20 to 30 top toys sold in the country, whatever those are, and you provide that, but then you also provide the ability to test drive it, right? So Mm. you've created a space that's as large as Toys R Us, but it's designed as like stations of like 
play with this gun or do this thing, you know, l- allowing the kid yeah. to actually play with it a little bit. And then, then he's like cut off from it. Like, so you got to right. buy it to take it Drive home. this power wheel outside right. in a little course or something. Right, yeah. right. Things like that. So they can. Or you're a dick like I like I am. Like, I'll go to the store. This is what I started <laughs> doing. That. I don't know if you guys do this, but we'll go to the store. Okay. So, like, we went to, um, what's that place? Uh, What's that outdoor store oh, that yeah. by uh, uh, not Bass big, Pro? Shop? No, no, not Bass Pro, but anyway, it was one of those. One of those. <laughs> and we went there to get my kids' hiking shoes and camelbacks because we're going to do a bunch of hiking. REI? No. Yes, REI. Okay. So I'm in there and we're looking at like hiking shoes. I'm like, oh, this is a good one. Try these on, son. He tries them on. I'm like, let's look at the price. Oh, that's you know eighty five dollars. Let me just look that up on Amazon. Yeah. Cool. What size do you need? Boom. Just order it. Let's go try something else. Oh, oh yeah. Camelback. This is the one you like? Yeah. Oh, great. How much is it? $100 here. Let me look it up on Amazon. Oh, cool. No, $90-something. Boom. Just order. I left the store with one item, but I ended up buying like five Yeah. because I went to the store, and while I was there, looked it up on Amazon, <laughs> found it to be cheaper. I have Prime, so it ships for free, and it's at my house within two days, and I ordered it. And so, I thought to- So why wouldn't Amazon create like just a storefront? Totally. You know? Totally. And so you do that. You buy it like on site or it's like, you know, incorporated. Yeah, they have they they provide so much. Could you imagine the size of that store? What that would have to be? I know. <laughs> It'd have to be like specific. It wouldn't work. Yeah, it, it wouldn't, wouldn't work. work. Welcome to Amazon. Amazon has, and, they don't give a shit about that. No, they don't give yeah, a fuck about, give a about that. About they, well, they do their grocery what, store. What stores will start That's to do true. what stores will start to do is they'll start to create these little you know, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever they are, they're making. It's like they'll have a small, and I think Apple is a great example of this. So I, I think a lot of stores will start to look like the Apple it's store. It's a showroom. It's, it's a showroom. showroom. Yeah. It's a showroom. It's yeah. a showroom for you to come touch it, feel it, play with it a little bit. And mm-hmm. then you just, you get on your phone and you really, yeah, order. you don't really carry inventory. You, you just want yep. to understand the product and feel your yep. way through it. And to me. that point where I bet you they won't even carry it. Like they'll even tell people, you go, yeah. Oh, I want to buy this. Like, Oh, we don't carry that. You just got to order right yeah, here. Order right here. It'll be here at your house tomorrow. Maybe, maybe even work exactly. with, maybe even work with Amazon. On. Maybe exactly. you create your own, you know, storefront, and it's small. That would be cool. really smart because then you save money on on rent, right? So instead of having a twenty thousand square foot, you know, facility, it's five thousand square feet because it's just a showroom. You show yeah. up, just make it look nice. Yeah, see what you like, and then just order it on Amazon right here. And because you're ordering it here today, we're going to give you an extra five percent off or something like that. You know, there's, there's a lot of ideas I could see uh, that that they're going to have to try to work with because yeah, I think the retail market, the well, storefront, it's disrupted the whole thing. I mean, oh. the whole retail market is. I mean, they really have to scramble to figure this out because it's a dying breed. Well, bro, look at look at our business, right? We sell fitness programs that people buy and they get access to and they get all this information. Mm-hmm. You know, 15 years ago, you bought DVDs and or VHS or you know all that shit, mm-hmm. which costs money. You had to ship it. It wasn't instant. So look how much it's just dist- like. Does anybody order workout DVDs anymore? Probably not. Yeah, right. It's know. it's changed a lot. So anyway, t- talking about new technology. Did you guys see that um, researchers are coming up with tooth mounted trackers? Yes, dude. I was just gonna. Have, that was the next thing I was gonna bring. Were you up, gonna bring bro. the same thing? Yes, dude. I was tooth re- mounted. Trackers? Yes, you stick a sensor on your tooth and it tracks the food for you, bro. Yep. Real soon here, it's going to be- Oh, I speculated. Like I, w- I was trying to, to w- when I was going through like all the wearables and everything, I'm like, nobody's really invented something that will automatically track food or intake or water, or whatever. You know, it's, Dude, not, it's not automated. I am so excited Crazy. about it. And I know there's there's a lot of camps on this, like when you talk about unplugged and the technology going that direction. So with that, we're becoming uh, so detached. But these types of tools, what I remember what Fitbit- Dude, it's all about sensors. So- I, I can't. I truly believe that we would take a huge chunk. I really believe this out of obesity by just the ability for people to mindlessly be able to eat the same way they do and and stuff, but then to be told and aware of it right away. Yes. Like if I had a, a, a Apple Watch Feedback. or Fitbit Fitbit Watch that just said, you know, you you're at a total burn of 900 calories today. You just consume 1500. Right, you know, and it, it boom, it pops up on my phone, mm-hmm. and I'm like, oh shit! You it know? tells you right away. Yeah. Right, that, tells you that your proteins, feed, fats, carbs. It'll even tell you. the laziest, fattest people, <laughs> I believe, would see that and go like, shit. Okay, I need to at least go move. Do they explain how this works? Like, it's just it, a sensor. It sounds like magic. It's yeah. just a sensor. So the one that they've already created, obviously, it hasn't. They haven't created one that can detect everything yet. But the one that they have okay. created does pizza. No, it does, <laughs> it's, it's, it's pizza. It's only. the pizza tracker. <laughs> it tracked. Uh, they tested it to track uh, sugar and alcohol. Uh, excuse me, uh, water and alcohol. Uh, so people were eating or drinking things, and then to see if it would accurately measure 
thirty percent alcohol, you know, seventy percent water, whatever, uh-huh. and it worked. Wow. So I mean, we're 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 I mean, we're not there what yet, a trip. but yeah. it's coming. That's progress, though. That's crazy, dude. Think about it. you go to the doctor. They're like, oh, would you like the food thing in your shirt? Sure, no yeah. Although, God, imagine if someone got a got but a hold then of that gonna data. Control you <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Everybody got that data. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like if I, like if you're like a communist country, and you're uh, like, we need to ration some of the well, food that we're giving out. This is these, send out a thing like ah, it's these types of tools too. Why? I mean, I I always tell trainers like, I mean, if you're still stuck doing just the brick and mortar and you're not thinking about the future of where where our space is going to be, it's going to flip on its head. Of course. We, we talk about why is that? Why is that any different? Like, why am I going to go drive to some gym where I have to see my trainer at a specific time that I can only train with him? When I can have that same accountability from him with all these tools and sensors, it's getting to the point where it's like there, there, it's tough to create a lot of value in that one-on-one meeting, like and convince you to come in and see me when you're going to have access to all these tools. Because if I had that, if I had something like that, oh my God, you know how easy it is to coach clients? Like, yeah. I mean, you, if it's you, if, you just get a report, yeah. right? You get a report every day. Oh, looks like yesterday. And, 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 then, and, and then now it's the coaching more looks more like this. Like they get the report. There, you're there as somebody to just answer questions. You need, like Adam. Oh, I, I did this. Was that the right thing to do, or yeah. should I have done that? And it's like I can handle that all via right. text. And think, then you have you have your panel, right? So like your doctor Molly Maloof, and then you have you know your trainer, then you have your physical therapist, and you know all these people are your virtual. Like every now and then, you kind of like check in. Right. You know, and then they they evaluate your data. It's super easy, streamlined. It's preventative. Like you're gonna avoid the hospital. Everybody's health insurance gonna go down. All that stuff. Yeah, I could. Uh, I can see tremendous value and benefit in something like that. So, but I th- also think people like to, you know, work with humans at the same time. Yeah, so the, that value is always gonna. There be always well, yeah. there will always be you know the wealthy that don't give a fuck. You know what I'm saying? It's like what's 150. Well, we know the psychological piece is. is such a big part right? and, like, then the, and the human interaction yeah. right like i mean i'm not saying and i think that's a, a, important and that you said that that when i say this i'm not telling trainers like you're all your jobs are done and five no, it's just gonna change <laughs> it's just it's, it's yeah gonna it's, it's gonna radically change and you know i would already be on the way of like thinking of like, how am i gonna adapt my business mm-hmm. to the way we're gonna do business in the next five to ten years in health and fitness space and you got to be paying attention to tools like this because it's going to change the game yep. i mean how often do you guys now see people wearing fucking and Fitbits or Apple. I mean, fucking everybody has yeah. one now. Like it's. Yeah. I think part of the reason why Fitbit is dying is just because everybody's got a tool yeah. like that now. It's. Like, I think it's not the a next. Deal. I think the next level, even beyond that, is when you have a sensor that obviously senses what you eat, what you drink, but also is able to detect activity, and then also is able to connect how your body's responding to those foods, which mm. we already know that there's like the science. glucose. Yeah, 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 like measuring your insulin, yep. or hey, it looks like when you eat this particular food your bowel movements end up becoming like this or your fatigue was up this way, but your cortisol raised because when you eat this food, starts making all these connections for you, you know, and, and, and tells you them, which will then help you make those connections yourself and start to eat better according to your own individual body because as we know very, very well, and it's controversial to say in medical uh, circles, um, the individual variance with food is massive dude glucose glucose monitor on you, Fitbit on you, and a fucking tooth thing on you. And imagine how how much easier that's going to be for so many people to start to piece together what is right for their body or what's overdoing it, what's underdoing it. Then you just need something that makes you do it. Well, and, and, and that, you have all the information. Like, and, ah, this, fuck it. and this is where this is where Wrong. trainers will still be able to survive, and there will be that business model there, is because there are. I mean, hundred percent. I know you guys had this too. Yeah. At least half of my clients would openly admit that that. They don't need you anymore? Right. I've yeah, had no, them, me too. I've had them for years. I've taught them. I've given them all the knowledge I've got, so it's not like I'm giving them anything that new, or maybe when some shit new shit comes out, I drop it on them, yeah. but for the most part, yeah. I've given them all the information that I have within a year or two's yeah, time. You, you get to the point where you're training a client, and you just say the exercise. You know what I mean? They know what to do. Yeah, yeah, all right, yeah. today we're doing this. Oh, cool. Let me go get the bar. Remember right. this? Yeah, let's yeah, do that. Let's do that one. But so. they admit that you know part of what keeps them coming is they know they have a $150 bill that will be hit on them if they yeah. don't show up to their appointment, yeah. and that's motivation. So. Some, There's a lot of interesting uh, mm-hmm. changes coming down the pipeline with health. I, so I was talking to somebody the other day about um, psychiatry, and they were saying how – so remember when we had Max on the show, right? Max uh, Lugavere. He talked about a study in 2017 where they looked at uh, food intake and nutrition and how it impacts uh, you know depression, for example. And they found that changing diet and nutrition, obviously not – 
but this is not shocking to us because we knew this, but it's shocking to the medical community that dietary intervention was extremely effective at making people feel better, less depressed, all that kind of stuff. Mm. So I was talking to somebody the other day who's going to school for psychiatry. So they're new. And they and I asked them, like, what kind of what are you looking to study? And, and they and they said nutritional psychiatry. That's a new Wow. Yes. Really? Nut- nutritional psychiatry is a so there's two aspects of psychiatry and psychology that are going to, in my opinion, completely revolutionize how we treat uh, mental health issues completely. Wow, there's a degree for that. Yeah, now. yeah. Uh, well, That's well, it's, exciting, a, it's a segment of it. Okay. Yeah. So, 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 like right now, if you're a psychiatrist or you're a psychologist and you've been practicing for ten or fifteen years, you don't learn any of this stuff. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to school now, or maybe if you start to go to school in a few years, this is going to be part of your like you're going to start learning this stuff. It's like being like doctors, like people in medical school today are learning way more about the gut microbiome than people who went to medical school 10 or 15 years ago, just because it's new, accepted information. So she's saying how now nutritional psychiatry is like this new, exciting thing that people are starting to look more into. And I firmly, so I think, like I said, the future of health, mental health treatments is going to be so different. I think we're going to enter into a completely new age of psychology and psychiatry, one of which being uh, nutritional interventions. Well, they'll take people with anxiety, depression, you know, with, uh, you know, paranoias, whatever. And they're going to look at diet and say, okay, let's manipulate and adjust your diet to see how that either a works in conjunction with this medication that we're putting you on. Because what some of these studies are showing is that if you're on a antidepressant drug and you include nutritional intervention, you have a huge, like a very, very good outcome. So I think that'll be part of it. And then maybe with the milder cases, you know, like with kids, for example, there's lots of evidence to show that, you know, things like ADD and ADHD, like your diet has a pretty big impact. There's even some studies showing mm. with some autistic kids will have improvements in their symptoms if they change their diet. So this is a brand new study or course of study in psychiatry that I think is going to have a massive impact. And then the second part, so check this out. So Jessica has another friend who's also going to study psychiatry. And they want to study specifically the use of psychedelics in uh, uh, Mm -hmm. psychiatric medicine. Mm. And that also is following the science because now you're having all all these studies that are being conducted and showing that, like the recent one that made all the news was how people with, you know, uh, treatment-resistant PTSD, which for the listeners who don't know, one of the more difficult things to treat uh, with, uh, with typical, you know, conventional means like therapy and medications like treatment resistant PTSD is just this enigma. Like we, we typically have a terrible track record of, of helping anybody. And it's, and sometimes it takes years to even see any kinds of improvement. Well, a study comes out that they combine therapy with MDMA, which is the popular drug found in, you know, ecstasy or Molly that within relatively few treatments. And I don't remember exactly how many, but it was like months. It wasn't years. It was like months of treatments that they had something like a 70% cure mm. rate. It's wow. crazy. That's Cure. So, that's so crazy. And now, are the regulations and all that loosening up a bit? They are. As far as using? Yes. And yes. That's great because yeah. the MAPS program? Yeah, because yeah. they're able to, to study them. And so, when you're talking about a 70% cure rate in a, in a population of people that has so a, crazy. a 0%, and when they say cure, what they mean is they visit, they do the therapy, they're done with it, the person says, oh my God, I'm so much better. Then they check on them six months later, then they check on them a year later, then they check on them two years later, and- 70% of them, you know, a year later, two years later is like, oh no, the treatment worked. Like it hasn't come back. So smart to have that in a clinical setting. You That's know? the way it's, it's like, going yeah, it to happen that way. Yeah. You do that and like, say it's like a, um, you know, deprivation tank or something, you know, like they, they add all the, this, this element there where it's controlled and they can really kind of dive Dude, deep. Think of a gener. imagine a generation of psychiatrists, a new generation of psychiatrists who they understand the conventional drugs. They understand SSRIs, anti-anxiety medications. They understand antipsychotic medications. They get all that. But they're also armed with a new tool, a consciousness-altering tool that they use with talk therapy and make it you know, a magnitude of 100 times more effective. Imagine what that'll do for 
for potentially what it'll do for mental health. Mm-hmm. You know, imagine you go to the, the, the doctor and you're like, I'm an alcoholic. Which seems I don't know to, how to be fix it. like one of the biggest problems we face, you oh. know, these days. Oh, like mental could, health is a big, a big issue. Dude, the percentage of Americans on antidepressants is insane. The percentage of children on ADD and ADHD medication in just the last five years is, is I think it's like, it's, it's grown like 50% or something like that. I should look up the statistics, but it's alarming it's insane. We're extremely medicated, and most of the medications are, or a lot of the medications are these, you know, psychiatric drugs. So I think we're about to see a revolution in how we treat mental health, both through the power of uh, of, of nutrition mm-hmm. and lifestyle change, which is new because that's something that they didn't really examine, and then the power of psychedelics and the use of talk therapy. Because here's the cool thing about the studies with psychedelics. It's not a pill you take every day. So it's not like you leave the office and you're depressed and they say, okay, we'll take this drug right. every day and then you're going to feel better. It's, no, 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 we're going to, you're going to do these, you know, the next two months or three months, you're going to do therapy with me once a week. Each time you meet with me, we're going to give gonna you- We're going to work this out. We're going to give you this dose of psilocybin or MDMA or, or LSD or whatever, you know, treatment. You're going to take this. We're going to do this crazy therapy. Then you're going to do some exercise and you're going to meet with But after about two or three months- that's typically how long we'll treat people. And then you don't take it this stuff anymore. And you get, the, like, that's going to be, that'll yeah. be pretty fucking yeah. awesome. No, it's around that'll, the corner, too. That'll be really, really remarkable. So, and so I, I think it's good because I like reading that kind of stuff because then it gets I think you're going to see it like in couples yeah. therapy. You, you, I, I, you know how that's many couples. That's what it was invented for. Yeah. You know how many couples I know that would wow. benefit from a fucking psychedelic trip together, dude? <laughs> so <laughs> many couples. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And even if you don't go psychedelic, even if you just were to get do like a, a micro dose of that stuff, I think that so many couples would. I, I, so I think. Sort of puts the spotlight on everything. Well, right? I, here's what I think. I think it's a, it's a powerful tool. And I think if you don't realize that and you go and think it's going to give you the answer, you may be in for a rude awakening. I know personally, I know. So I know one individual in particular, this young lady was suffering from anxiety and depression and she'd been hearing all these podcasters talk about how ayahuasca, psilocybin was the greatest thing they ever did and it cured everything and did all this wonderful stuff. And so she's like, oh cool, I'm going to go eat a bunch of psychedelic mushrooms and then I'm going to solve my problems. <laughs> <laughs> it, you, you know, it's, oh, no. you guys laugh, but a yeah. lo- you know how many people think that that's what, how it works? Right, like, yeah. Well, because we know people that are into all that stuff and you listen to how they talk about it. They're just like, oh, you gotta do it. You yeah. gotta try it because it was yeah. such a game changer for them, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so she did. She went and took a bunch of psilocybin mushrooms and ended up with terrible PTSD from it and now is going yeah. to conventional therapy because she's, she's had way worse things. I went, because, she she did unstructured. Yeah, I, like I could see it with a with a like a really um, well trained therapist, or maybe like a they call them guides, like if you know people who are experiencing this kind of stuff. Like I could see that, but I don't. I don't think this is a, a something you just take and that it works for you. I think you need to have. You need yeah. to know what you're doing with it and have some structure. Otherwise, it's just... Otherwise, it's just like you're just smoking a ton of weed yeah. and trying to solve things. It, it could turn it's into your. Work. It could turn into your worst nightmare yeah. you know imagine a nightmare you can't escape from for hours well, no, which you I, perceive as days because i, I time think is with distorted. something like that that kind of opens your mind up there there needs to be something uh beforehand that kind of preps you mentally that hey you know this could take you somewhere you have, you might have some really dark stuff buried inside that you don't realize that may you surface learn how to navigate through right. all that you, stuff that may yeah. surface and you need to be okay with that before we go in here. I think you'd have and to and assimilate and all that stuff cuz yeah. the the old studies the, the ones that were done in the 50s on psychedelics they talked about how cuz that's where we had a lot of science before now before uh, maps is doing it all is that uh you know and those they they even said and even the map studies say that set and setting are just as important as as the substance so oh, I can see that so just you have a substance which is very powerful, just as important and part of the protocol, part of the prescription is also where you're doing it. So like if you if you you know take a bunch of psilocybin mushrooms and then you you know go to a busy shopping mall or a, you know maybe a concert or maybe around people you don't really know, you know if you if you trust or whatever, that could totally change everything. Mm-hmm. And then also your mindset. Like are you are you super depressed and suicidal and then you're going to take this thing? It could end up tipping you in the balance of, you know, of, of going in the wrong direction. So, you know, that's, that's, that's my personal opinion, but I do think we're going to, we're, we're entering into a new era of medicine. That's kind of exciting. So Agreed. did you guys see some, here's some current, uh, some crazy current <laughs> events. 
you guys remember the whole deal with Corey Feldman? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're talking about the molestation and all that. I remember stuff. what he what he did, right? He yeah. he talked Took about how blast. Yeah, he's like, I'm gonna reveal like the top Hollywood people that are in these 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 you know pedophilia groups and, or whatever. Yeah, who take advantage of the children in Hollywood. And he told these horrible stories, and then you know, ever since then, he's saying he's been getting death threats and. He told the LAPD at one point, like he made a list of names. Then the LAPD said they lost it. That was when he was a kid, right? Yeah. Then they said they lost it all. And then miraculously, you know, someone yeah. found it. So that list is out there. Okay. So he's like, he's talking about, and he's, he's, he's naming names, starting to name names, right? And he's talking about how he's, he has to hire security because he's like, I'm getting threats. This is really crazy. We all know how powerful Hollywood is. Well, the other day he was in his car with his security and I think like three or four men approached the car and two of them distracted his security. One of them opened his door and tried to stab him several times. What? This, yeah, this has happened. When? Uh, like like recently, I just read this article like this today. I think I read it today. Did he stab him? No, he did, he's fine. He's in the hospital. It was all good. But his, so what he wrote on his Twitter was, he goes, I'm in the hospital I was attacked tonight. A man opened my car door, stabbed me with something. Please say prayers. Thank God it was only myself and my security. Yeah, so fuck. Dude, Damn, like that, dark. huh? Dude, this is... I knew he was coming out with a lot. I watched one of his like uh, interviews just not that long ago. I think I told you guys about it. I didn't realize it's getting heated like that with him. Man. What if it's true? Of course it's true. Well, why wouldn't it is, be? Yeah. Of course it's yeah. true, bro. God, that terrifies People me. attacking him and of shit. Of course it's true. That terrifies me. That there's that that there's a well, there's come a, on, a look, powerful group that's dude, doing that. That's look, so terrifying. Yeah, look what happened. Bro, uh, I've heard worse with politicians. I've yeah. heard some dirty shit with politicians oh, that are like yeah. that that have. But they've, they're, they, they're. How about the people tied to Penn State? I mean, lie to like another. Yeah, exactly. Right. Penn come on, dude. That that was like. What happened? How there? the hell could that have even happened? Yeah. Other than people covering everything up. That shit makes me sick. Oh, it's, yeah. but God, it, that makes me sick. But it's just it's terrifying when a guy like this, like he tries to come out and yeah. he's getting like death threats. You know what I mean? Like or, yeah. or and uh, attempts on his life. If that's really the, the there's case. some evil fucks out there. I know that there's some powerful but, evil. Fucks. That's the part that terrifies me. Right? Is that there's this? Is it feels like there's this organized group? Yeah. yeah but this is um, again. This is also what excites me about the the era that we're in now with the shit's yeah, getting aired putting, out. Yeah, put, it's dude, just. I mean, real soon here, you just the light is shining on that shit. Yeah, you can't be that. You can't be a fucking big big person in Hollywood or a big person in, in politics and get away with shit and get away with shit very anymore. Like, I mean, somebody is going to have seen you or find you or not like you, and to get it out there, it's so much. It was so much easier to silence somebody 20, 30 years ago. Like mm -hmm. to silence. Something that you did, it's just like, dude, fuck it, it's out. It's true, because what could you have done back then, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But now you could just tweet yeah, you know, yeah. right away, By which now. is what he did. Right. Fuck, that's so terrifying to me. It's crazy, man. It's funny. It's it's funny because you know, uh, with my kids, you know, with social media and all that, and my daughter in particular, starting to show a lot of interest in what we do here mm -hmm. at work. Mm -hmm. Loves the fact that you know I'm on YouTube. She actually, the other day, we were watching, we were on YouTube together. She pulls up Mind Pump. She's like, oh, it's your channel. This is so cool. And she's, you know, trying to watch videos. I'm like, I don't know. I hope, I'm, you know, I'm trying to pick the ones I think are safe for her to watch or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at some point, she'll listen to podcast. But she's, she thinks her dad is like the coolest thing ever. Well, in, <laughs> in their, so bro, thing. in their world, right? So their age and younger, like TV like, doesn't. Yeah, TV, TV does. They don't give a shit. Like, Tom Cruise, Brad YouTube. Pitt, yeah, names like that. They don't. Who don't give yeah. a fuck about them? But like, she, yeah, she, they'll, they'll rattle off YouTube stars all day yeah. that you don't even know who they are. And you saw how she was when I brought her here. Was a, like a couple weeks ago. She sat in Justin's chair. She was in front of the mic. Yeah, she likes the camera. She tells me she wants to practice being in front of the camera. And I'm I'm not trying to be like the dad that's like no because I know she'll rebel. Right? No, so I love that. We need more work around. It's her. cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but dude. I should, I should show you a video my son created what are the, where he's, you, he's demonstrating stuff. Like he, he's he's acting like a host. What are the laws on that? They're it's your hilarious. kids. Can we have them cleaning and working here for free? Is that what, yeah? What? It's family. Yeah, so, I think so. So there's no laws around that. <laughs> I don't tell anyone. Yeah. I just call it chores. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm very yeah, it's chores. I'm very pro. You guys bring yeah. the kids. Make around. some tennis shoes. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna see yeah, chores. No, but you know what makes me what makes me afraid is I well not afraid because I don't think this is gonna happen. I don't I think the future is so different anyway. But I'm yeah. just imagine like if my kid is like really loves it, talented, wants to be an actress, wants to be in Hollywood, whatever. Fuck no. 
fuck no. I will stop that with every fucking fiber of my being. <laughs> not in a million years. You know yeah. what I mean? Well, we're seeing right now, of course, Hollywood's not as big of a deal, but everybody wants to be a YouTube star. Yeah. Everybody wants to have their YouTube channel and say that it's become, you know, the cool thing to say. Like, oh yeah, I got a YouTube channel. You know, I'm a yeah. YouTuber. I'm a YouTuber. Yeah. Well, yeah. so my son, I've been talking to him because he's really, he likes, he's pretty good with his computer. Well, obviously his age group, they all are, right? And so I told him like, you know, dude, I said, if you learn how to uh, edit videos, because I'm going to get, I'm going to buy him the software mm -hmm. so he could just have fun. Ugh. I'm like, if you I learn, your head's at you know yeah, exactly yeah. where I'm going. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, if you can get good at editing videos, like one of the best part-time jobs you could have is you could edit our videos. You'll get paid to do it. It's incredible. It'll look great on your resume, and you just go to school at the same time. It'll be awesome. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I told him like we'll pay you two bucks an hour. Which, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of money for twelve. Yeah, no, I, hey, Nobody tell him. Nobody. Tell I used him. to walk dogs for twenty five cents. I Did you really? Yeah, and then it, it built up to a fifty cent piece, and then it built up to a silver dollar. And that's what I did, man. You're a as terrible a negotiator. That was not, that's not even that much money from back then. I didn't care. It was an old lady, <laughs> man. You know what I mean? Like, what the hell did you buy with a quarter? And I stacked it up, too. Like, I had, I think I built up like $500 worth of like 50 cent pieces. Holy that's a, shit. It's a lot of walks. It was a lot, man. <laughs> You're a fucking champion. I fucking grinded my way. You probably leaned to as the fuck top. back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> or shredded. Yeah. Did you really walk them or did you just go around the corner? I'm actually, up and I'm looking yeah, for, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking for a dog walker right now. I was telling Katrina. Oh, the app. Do the app that Amanda Bucci showed us. Remember? I don't remember the name of that app. Okay, so I'll, I'll send her a message. So, brilliant. Okay. When we when we did the podcast with her, which by the way, it's it's up now and people are loving it, but we were podcasting and she had her little dog. I don't remember his name. What his name was. Fido, we'll call him. Fido. Fido. <laughs> yeah. Has anybody named their dog yeah. Fido? Buster. In the last Since 30 like, years. Yeah. Spot. So, yeah. Uh, so, the dog's playing. Cute dog, by the there way. There it is. Wag. Wag. That's, that's it. That's it. You sign up for this, and it's like Uber or whatever. Wherever you're at, you have the app, and then you you say, okay, I need a dog, someone to pick up my dog for a walk. And somebody sees you on the app, they'll come to your location, grab your dog, take him from walk, and then you just pay for it through the app. It's like fucking Sweet. Uber. As long as they don't steal the dog, it's awesome. Yeah, well, yeah. well, like I think Uber, they get screened. Yeah, well, you get ratings. It'd be just like Uber. I mean, it, you. I mean, I guess <laughs> like poor rating. Yeah, I want my dog back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You get one, two stars. Never, yeah, yeah. never return the dog. Yeah, don't, don't use this guy. I imagine you have. Yeah. I imagine you have all of your personal information if you're in there, right? So, yeah. so it's still your dog. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I will report your ass. Yeah, yeah. I, think, <laughs> I think you'd find him. I think they, it's, a, it's a brilliant idea. No, that is brilliant. If they, if they kidnap your dog, that. if they kidnap your dog, you just get a refund. That. So, don't worry about it. <laughs> so when I had when I when I bought my uh, my years ago when I bought my house uh, which I no longer own thanks divorce uh, I had <laughs> shout out yeah shout out divorce taking yeah, taking yeah, money yeah. from me since you know this last two years ago so anyway uh, I what's put that, what's that joke of you, when you're getting married it's betting betting half your stuff that this will work out yeah yeah so anyway I put a child those childproof fences because I had a pool and my kids were young. Yeah. And, and you know, if you look at the statistics on, by the way, this is why I, why I recommend everybody be objective about shit. I wasn't worried about getting my kids getting kidnapped or anything like that because the odds are really low, but I did see the statistics on kids drowning. It's actually quite high. Yeah. So I ordered a, a pool, uh, one of those fences, those childproof fences. So the guy comes, he's installing it. So I'm having, a, I'm having a conversation with him and I'm like, so how, uh, like how good are these things? Like, Oh, they're fucking, they're really great. You can't go under them. You can't climb them. You know they're they're childproof. This and that. And I said, so you guys guarantee that it's childproof? He's like, yes. Yeah. So I'm like, if my kid drowns, do I get a full refund? The look on the guy's face. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> he did not know how to respond. He had to no that idea. Off. He's like, huh? Like what? he thought I was serious. He's what? like, yeah. Oh yeah, we could do that. We could yeah, give yeah, you yeah, money. Yeah. I mean, I want a refund if my. There's kid a lot drowns. of paperwork involved, but uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Let's see what we can do. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if they're gonna have. Uh, do they have babysitter apps? Uh, yeah, they do. They do, right? Yeah, they do. Um, uh, Care.com, I think, is really? one of them. Yeah, we they should. Just, they just I show up. Know, free plug for you, yeah. Yeah, they, do you uh, use them? No, no, no. No, I I've keep everything in the family as, as much as possible, and then my neighbor. I, I don't know, man. It's tough. I, I'm sure they vet. You know, I'm sure there's great people on there, and like I just haven't like been in a position where I feel like comfortable with that. Yet. Yeah, that's a scary one because stealing kids is a bigger deal than stealing dogs. It's a dogs. little bit bigger. Yeah. I, you know what, Adam, a, I have to agree with that. Yeah. I have to agree with that <laughs> yeah, statement. It's it is. Bit. It's a, stealing kids. Is, you know that. Uh, so when Justin, my buddy, just had his kid, they they put like these little sensors on their feet now. I know. 
Yeah, because it's so popular that people come into the baby area and they fucking steal kids. I didn't know that. <laughs> that's a real, like, like, God. You just, they switch look. them out. Well, yeah, there's some you know, shenanigans that have I'm happened. Not, I'm not a believer. That's up there with, you know, key in my car. Like, you know, you key my car, you steal my kid. That's it's an L- ass whooping and a half coming your way, dude. Like, <laughs> yeah. those people I worked get... hard for that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's very, Don't just go take that there, away from me. There's very few things that would, like, motivate me to consciously th- Try to kill you, like I, like my goal is to murder you right now, right? And yeah. that's one of them. That it would is. be one yeah. of them. The key That'd in the be car. A high one. One. I'm talking about the key in the car. One. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. For yeah. sure, you key my Jetta. You key my 2012 Jetta with the with the with the yeah. <laughs> to the scratch. I remember when someone keyed my Corolla. I was like, of all the vehicles, I drive. You had that done, yeah, oh, dude. Someone keyed the brutal. fuck out of my Corolla one time, and I kind of laughed about it. And for one, my insurance will cover all that shit, but I'm like. Of all the vehicles, like that's the one I don't give that two. shit is personal. Yeah, it is. It was more like, dude, who fucking? Like, does? Wow. I was like, whoever this is, they don't know me very well. Like, fuck your shitty car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. like, like, ah, you really want to ah. get to me? If you really want to get to me, you fuck with one of the other cars where there's a little bit more money in the paint job than the fucking. Bro, car. you have. Yeah. You have. You must. I mean, goddamn, you've done some. You've done some some <laughs> dirt, bro. <laughs> This is how Dude, you know. No wonder you got one bad review. This is how you, you know. know I mean? This is how you know yeah. when you're if you're if you if you have if you're dating a dude or you you got a buddy and you want to know if this guy's done some dirt <laughs> against women. Yeah. Ask them how many times their car's been keyed <laughs> or if they've had their car stolen or shit like that. Or right? their house burned down. Yeah. So yeah. for example, Adam, how many times have your car's been keyed? So my I've had two cars keyed and two <laughs> oh my God, and, and two cars stolen. Wow. That's yeah. you've dabbled in a little bit of crazy. That's a little bro. And, and you you got to pick different. Well, you got you with Katrina now, so you're all good. Yeah, all yeah, the yeah. times it happened to me, I remember like, of course, that's the first thing as a guy that you go through the Rolodex like, of, wow. what girls did I piss off? Like, did, did I really do it? Looking that bad? back, do you see the signs like you know of that type of a girl? That no, would, you know uh, why? Because of the ones, the girls that do do that, right? The ones that are crazy enough to do that, they're fucking crazy anyways. Like it was probably because I didn't re- respond to a Facebook post. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> that's what that that it was that my my the the signs that I have now looking back were the type of women that I was dating. Yeah, they were right. just crazy right, in general. Right, right. So they like were already- the characteristics. Yeah, like, it wasn't like I did, like I wasn't a guy that did girls. In fact, I prided myself on almost every girl that I'd ever dated ever. I've remained in good contact or good relations. I'm a good, we, we have, we're friends, right? Like I didn't, there wasn't hate when we ended. Yeah. So I always prided myself, but I will be the first to admit that there's probably been a streak of crazies that were in there for a while there. You know, I had this- my mo was, you know, the going for the girl that's had the sign on her back there. Or I had the sign on my back that said, you know, I will help you type of deal, right? So I got a lot <laughs> yeah, of, yeah. I got, I got, I what played they call the, that captain, Come captain save a captain save a yeah, You know yeah. what? And this is something Hop for I think a lot of. This is also why I think that getting married before you've twenty five or thirty years old is just how do you do that because you're still figuring out who you are. And I really think a lot of the the women that I gravitated early on in my imagine life, had you married got married that age. Oh, dude. You 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 tend to yeah. you You'd tend be like to, me. Bad you, idea. You tend to the navigate worst. or or are drawn to the things your the things that patch or cover up your insecurities or the things that you shouldn't be with. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it's like if I had all these if I had these mother issues or father issues or all this stuff that it's rooted from childhood, it makes sense that I started to gravitate towards these girls that I wanted to play like this father role with, which seemed like it, I was attracted to that because I liked it at the beginning, but then after time. After I've been in that role for a while, you should realize like, ah, oh I didn't God, want to sign up exhaustive. for being a yeah. dad here. Like, this is supposed to be a partnership. They're supposed to equally help equally me grow. Yoked. Right. So I think a lot of people fall in that trap. Don't realize. Did you get? It. Would you get bored real fast with them? <clears throat> I Probably, wouldn't say right. I wouldn't say real fast because I think I, I again I got off on the I had some fun along the way. You know. Well, I I, I enjoyed I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed being that you know, uh, being the leader in the relationship. I always did it. And I did a lot of girls that were my age or older. Most of them were, but I just had a little more life experience. And so I played a, a kind of a father role and I actually, I liked it. You know why? Cause it, it fed my ego. Yeah. You felt, mm. you felt and, more. Right. And that was an insecurity. It was an insecurity of mine that I needed to feel like I was this, you know, super smart guy and I knew all these things. Therefore I dated these girls mm-hmm. and I could teach them everything, mm-hmm. but they weren't really teaching. Were, were really smart, like super confident, self-aware women back then. Was that someone that you w- would have not been attracted to? No, because I, what, what I was drawn to was finding women like that, that I was still smarter than, right? Mm-hmm. So that was what pushed me to grow. So it served me a lot. It was like, I, I didn't want some dumb girl, you know, I didn't date mm-hmm. a bunch of dummies. Like I did, but I dated a lot of girls that, I w- just had, like I said, more life experience or were more educated in certain areas. And so 
I wa- I liked playing that role. You see the Tinder profile, like PhD, CEO, uh, daddy issues. Oh, pff, swipe right. Right. I'll be yeah. taking it over. Right. That was definitely, yeah. that was my, my MO. So yeah, so, and uh, of course, a lot of PhD, brilliant women that I dated, they might have been brilliant in book smart, but then as far as their communication, their social skills, their family issues, things like that, like, you know, my, with my experience and my background, I just had... I had a lot to give and share with those people, mm-hmm. and that fed me a lot, but it fed the wrong things. Yeah, me. it's, you know, that whole thing, like, you have to really, truly love yourself before you can really, truly love someone else. Agreed. It's so, it's so true because it, you're only going to be, you're only going to be able to partner with someone, uh, you know, that's based on your, your own weaknesses. I mean, it's all, that's like the limiting factor. Like, if you're this insecure individual in these particular areas and you don't feel confident with yourself, then that's, you're going to end up seeking people that you feel you deserve. And if you don't think you deserve much, right. that's what you end up with. And that's what it means, like, love yourself, you know, or, or you have to love yourself first because if you don't, why would I be with – like, if I didn't love myself fully, of course I'm going to choose someone who's going to kind of treat me like shit a little bit and not be that great and awesome because I don't deserve any better in my mind. Yeah. You know, but if I love myself truly, I know what I deserve and what I'm worth and I'm not going to allow someone to treat me a particular way or to be a particular way because mm-hmm. – I care about myself. That's why it's so it's so. Well, fucking and, when you, and when you truly know yourself, you know your the deepest, darkest secrets and insecurities about yourself. And when once you've made that connection, it makes it easier to kind of evaluate relationships that you have. And this is not just you know uh, sexual relationships. This means like personal and friends, and business, everything. yeah, all Every, relationships. Yeah. Like it's amazing what uh, you know. We have this kind of primal instinct that we all have in us to, that we, we tend to gravitate towards. And then you also have these factors that play a role that of how you were raised and everything that you tend to gravitate to these type of people all the time and learning to be able to detach yourself and go like, well, what is it about them that I continue hanging out with them all the time? Or why am I drawn to yeah, these Yeah, once you type become the common denominator, you got to ask that question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's a, such an important role. Yeah, because I'll talk to people, you know, like friends of mine, they'll be like, oh man, I keep getting in these shitty relationships and what we're all the good men and this and that like okay well <laughs> what's the common denominator exactly yeah. okay what's well, happened are. three times now so it's happened mm. three times all kind of similar shitty situation you know what's in common with let's look at this like a math equation right yeah, what's what the are one, you attracted to yeah, yeah what's the one common denominator in the situation and it's so hard for someone to swallow that pill because i and how many times have you guys heard that like girls or guys that are saying like, oh, I always wear all the good guys or I continue to date douchebags. Well, okay, well, why is that? What do you keep, what are you drawn to? You got to break that pattern. Like you're drawn to something that's probably rooted back to like fucking seven years old with your father or your mother. And that's why you keep going after these relationships and you have no idea how unhealthy they are, but they feel good because they feel comfortable at first because it's all you know. It's what you've been raised to think is normal. So, So you're drawn to that. And here's what's interesting subconsciously people want what they think they deserve. Okay. This is very important to, to, to understand. So if you think poorly of yourself, if you think you're a piece of shit, if you think you're not worthy, if you're whatever, you want what you think you deserve. You actually want it. So you see people like this all the time, like people who eat terribly or are overweight and hate their bodies. The kind of workout they want is the one that punishes them. Mm-hmm. Because that's what they think they deserve. Yeah, they they don't want they don't want the one that feels good and stuff like that. Because I don't deserve that. This is why people sabotage relationships. They'll be dating someone. They'll sabotage mm-hmm. because they don't mm-hmm. deserve. Maybe that person is too good for them. This is that whole like you know like uh, you get that like, like that stereotype where you have that girl who's only attracted to assholes. Um, and if she's with a nice guy, she'll sabotage her or leave leave him. Yeah, because she subconsciously you want they what you think deserve. it's like they get bored with it but really they're just like they're sabotaging because they don't feel comfortable you want to be punished for being a shitty person or thinking that you're a shitty person or thinking you're not this great person and so you you subconsciously will seek out that punishment because we all want what we deserve so if you truly love yourself um you're going to treat yourself in a way where you think you deserve good shit if you don't well, you're going to be in your way until you figure that out for your entire life. Agreed. This quaz brought to you by Organifi. 
For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use the coupon code MINDPUMP for 20% off at checkout. Our first question is from Blackburn7171. What's the quickest way to lose belly fat? Ooh, the qui- the absolute quickest Let's way to go lose straight to the quickest form. Right, is to probably take an exacto knife and then you're gonna squirt. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that'd probably be the fastest. Get a way. vacuum and, and you suck know, it, shove suck it, it right in there. And <laughs> yeah, just kill it right away. Yeah. I, you, the, you know, I'm joking, but you know, I say. You know why this question is as simple as it sounds? Mm. The, this is the most common question we get. No, and yeah. I went this direction by saying something silly like that because uh, this is kind of how I would. When somebody would ask me a question like this, I'd always say, "Well, the quickest way." Well, the quickest way is not the way I always suggest. It's not. No, I mean, it literally is liposuction. Like if you someone came to me and said, "Hey, I want to lose Adam twenty pounds as fast, or lose belly fat, or twenty pounds as fast as I possibly can," I go, "Okay, excellent. What I'm going to have you do is you're not going to eat any food for the next two weeks." You're going to get on the treadmill and you're going to go every single day. Mm. Now, I tell people, like, don't really do that. You're probably going to die on your way <laughs> trying to do that. But that's an extreme analogy of what you're asking me right now. You're asking me the fastest way to do it. Well, the fastest way to do it isn't necessarily the most sustainable way to do it. So when we lose this belly fat, are you interested in just losing it right now as quick as you possibly can at any extremes and measures to do that? Or do you want to lose this belly fat and not put it back on for the rest of your mm-hmm. life? Mm-hmm. Like, that's what I would ask right back. You're... you're- your body is, um, it's your house, except you can never move out of it, right? You, you, you live in this for the rest of your life. So if you were building a house, just imagine this for a second. Let's say you had the opportunity to build your own house and you knew that that's where you were going to live for the rest of your life. You were never going to be able to move or whatever. This is where you're going to live. Would you take a bunch of workers and would you ask them, make me a house as fast as humanly possible? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or would you say, Make this the most quality, best house you possibly can. Yeah. So the question shouldn't be, and I'll answer the quickest way too, but it shouldn't be what's the quickest way. The The question should be what's the best way? Mm-hmm. What's the best way to lose right. body fat or belly fat or whatever you want to call it? That's the, the question you want to ask because the best way, first off, isn't super slow either. I think people confuse the best with the slowest because no, that's not, that's not the, the slowest. There definitely is a slowest way. No, you want progress. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's like just a normal thing. You're still going to progress, and you're still going to progress relatively quickly. It's just not as quick as doing it the quickest way, which is the wrong way. Now, why is the quickest way the wrong way? Well, the quickest way would be dramatically reduce your calories and dramatically increase your activity level, and blingo, blingo, you're going to lose you know pounds of body fat uh, and maybe some, and some muscle. Yeah. Um, Poof, on you're a, skinny. Yeah. On, a, on, a, on a really tell the consistent basis until your metabolism starts to uh, adapt and adjust, and then you have to do that again, where now you got to cut even more calories and increase your activity even more. And we, and it's not you didn't take a rocket scientist to see where that leads and, and what what ends up happening. But if you did follow that protocol and just did that ad nauseum, just keep applying those two principles to keep losing fat as fast as possible, where you'll end up is, yes, you'll have less weight on you, but you'll also have uh, worse fitness. You'll have a metabolic rate that's far slower Mm -hmm. because the metabolism does adapt. You'll have some hormonal issues where your body now may be, you know, your cortisol and your adrenal hormones and your catecholamines and the way they communicate with each other and your pituitary and the way that communicates with those starts to adjust and change because You've just done gone the route of cutting calories and increasing activity. You're gonna have less muscle. Yeah, to the point where you know, look, I do a little bit of coaching on the side, right? I still do a little bit of coaching. The vast majority of people that message me are people, men and women, but usually women, but also men, who say the following to me: I did three shows last year, or I did three shows two years ago, got my body weight down to 110 pounds, and I was shredded. And you know, I would like to just weigh 125 pounds, which is nice and lean. But now my body weight's 150 pounds, and I'm only consuming 12 to 1300 calories a day, and I'm still working out every day, and I don't know what the hell's going on. Mm-hmm. And this is like two years later. So if you want to put yourself in a position like that, well, then your goal should be always quickest, 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 quickest. And I promise you, at some point, you know, some people's bodies are more resilient than others. You'll end up in that in that position, and then you're. You're fucked because I feel bad. I, I, I will work some with some of these people and I'll tell them like, okay, well, here's the deal. 
you're doing an hour of exercise five days a week and you're consuming about 1,200 calories, um, it's going to take us probably a year to not lose the weight because we're probably not going to lose any weight in a year, but just to get you to the point where we can even start to examine restricting calories again and examine what weight loss is going to look for you. So you're going to have to come to terms with the fact that for the next year, not, you're going to be working very, very hard and you cannot use weight loss as a measurement of success. We're going to be looking at your health, your energy, your digestion, your relationship to food, how fast your metabolism's you know, getting, your strength, all those other things. You're going to have to completely forget weight loss and just accept that you weigh 160 pounds or whatever for the next year. And that is a shitty position to be in, especially for someone who identifies with their body. Right, right. But let's let's reframe this question to where we can kind of answer it for somebody is that, you know, let's assume that this person has a healthy metabolism and they're consuming, you know, well over 2,000 calories a day. Or whatever, yeah. Yeah, whatever that number is for them, right? So a healthy metabolism, so they're not in this low, like you said, mm-hmm. 1,200 calories. Um, I'm going to use some numbers that I, I used to use for clients to get the picture, although I know there's some nerd that's listening right now. Oh, I heard some other study that that's not very accurate. But yeah, That's not to, the point. It's not the point. So it, the idea is to give people an idea of what what is the healthy amount of body fat should I lose in a week and how much work does that actually take. So I'm going to give you some numbers. One, it's a healthy amount of body fat, okay, so fat to lose in a week, it's about a pound to two. I mean, you don't want to be... And that's that's fast. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot, right? That's on the upper end, right? So mm-hmm. you could even get away with a, a half a pound is still a good amount every single week. So why I tell people this is because a lot of times when we start on this fat loss journey or losing this belly fat, we come out the gates and we want to see as much results as possible and you, and you a week goes by and 10 pounds are off the scale and you're excited. And I would actually tell that client, no, bad, too much, yeah, too, too fast, too fast, too much, too fast. And we're really shooting ourselves in the foot long term. So I think that and, and that changes dramatically if you're also incorporating strength training for the first time, because I know that if you're starting to strength train while you're also trying to lose this this belly fat, I know your body's going to be adapting and building some muscle. So there's a really good chance that the scale is at zero. And if it is at zero movement, okay, example me right now, I'm on you know workout number eight coming up right now. I'm a little bit, I'm just under a month of training consistently and my weight has not moved. I'm at 208 is when I started and I'm at 208 right now. What does that tell yeah, me? Yeah, but you look different. I'm right on pace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I, my body is changing. Yeah, you've probably lost, you've probably lost size around your waist and everything too. Right, right. And it, but it's not a lot. It's not like, holy shit, mm-hmm. you know, but I, what I know is that I'm, I'm adding volume of training. I wasn't training like I am training right now. So I'm doing lifting like I wasn't. So I know my body's going to start to respond and build muscle. I'm also kicking up my movement steps. I'm also making better food choices. So all those things accounting for that, I know that my body's going to be building a little bit of muscle, burning a little bit of fat. So when I look at the scale, I actually don't want to see a huge shift. In fact, if I see a huge shift, that's my indicator that I need to either throttle back or that I can kick it up a notch. Like I also wouldn't want to see a huge increase on the scale. But to be honest, if I saw one pound up, I may not even adjust anything. I'm less concerned about even seeing a pound up with all the strength training I'm going to be doing because I know that my metabolism is going to be going mm-hmm. up. Mm-hmm. So, and then then taking the fact that, okay, roughly 3,500 calories equals a pound of fat. So if, if you're trying to lose that pound of fat in a, in a week's time, you know, creating a 3,500 calorie deficit through your movement through or the whole week. through the whole week is a good little strategy or a good place to be. And anything over that, you know, then you start flirting with slowing your metabolism down because you're restricting from so many calories. Yeah. So those are all, again, arbitrary numbers and everybody's going to be uniquely different and yada, yada, yada. But the reason why I want to use this as an example is because the, probably the biggest mistake that I see when people go after a goal like this is the desire to see change really fast. And if you actually understood that this is, and I, everyone's heard this before, but you got to really under, grasp it that it is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And nobody would come out the gates of a marathon sprinting as hard as you possibly can. So when you go after a goal like losing your belly fat, the strategy is not to do as much as possible right away to lose it as quickly. That might show you good results in two or three days, but at one point, your body's going to adapt to that, and then you're not going to see as much change. Yes. Here's a, and again, you know, the individual variance is pretty big. So this is general. This is very, very general. But the approach I typically would take with someone if their main goal is to lose body fat is I would start with first, we're going to try and build your strength. Now, why am I going to focus on building strength first? 
Well, if I ha- if I can get your metabolism to speed up, so to speak, then I have more to play with uh, later on. And I'm also protecting your body or protecting you from the metabolic adaptation that we don't want, which is a slower metabolism. It also balances out your hormones. It just it helps you burn body fat, all those different things. So step one, build more strength. Step two, uh, clean up the diet a little bit. What I mean by that is <clears throat> look at your diet and take out the big rocks that you can remove from your diet first. Like, okay, um, every day, you know, I start my day off with a frappuccino or you know, bagel I tend and to, cream cheese. Yeah, or a bagel and cream cheese or, you know, whatever. Okay, so start with one thing and clean it up a little bit and just change that. Make Change the food habits to being a little bit better than they, than they are now and start there, just there. Do that for a little while. That should yield you some progress already. You should start to see changes in your body, how you feel, and maybe even in the scale. Then the next step is look at your total calories and reduce them a little bit. Then the third stage is start to play with your macronutrients to make them more ideal. Then the fourth stage is now try to increase or in, you know, your calorie burn through NEAT. And then the next stage would be now we can add cardio. But you, you want to kind of follow those steps. And the, all those steps are not necessary, by the way. I'm not saying you have to, at the, at the end, add cardio. Many times, just resistance training, you know, a little bit more NEAT and cleaning up the diet, usually that's all, that's all it kind of needs and you get – pretty much where you want to go, but that's the sequence that I would follow. What you just listed is exactly what's happening, and I'll give people some ideas of what I'm doing right now, because my goal right now is to lose body fat. Like my, I have definitely put on weight, especially on my waist, that I'm not used to having, and it makes me feel uncomfortable. So along the lines of you know, starting to build some muscle, I primarily want to lose body fat more than anything else. So this is right up my goal, and of course, I'm trying to do it as fast as possible, but as efficient as possible. So... The first month, the goal was, because I knew I wasn't moving this much, I wasn't even getting 5,000 steps a day, so I don't want to crazy stretch myself, so my goal was right about 8,000 steps a day, so I just moved, picked up my neat just a little bit. I also was eating out every single day, at least once, if not multiple times a day, and I was eating out at a lot of my regular places, but I was also allowing things that I normally wouldn't allow. For example, if I eat at Five Guys or a burger place, I was eating fries with it. If I go to Chipotle, I'm having chips and guacamole with it. So if I'm having a poke bowl, I was having jalapeno chips with it. These are, And so I know that the jalapeno chips, the chips and guacamole, the French fries are not serving me very well. But it's also something that I was doing every single day, these types of choices. So now all I've done is I don't, I'm still going to Chipotle. I've still had five guys. I've cut the fries out, you know, and I didn't cut it out all the time. I cut it out more than half the time right now. So I'll take little things like that and just make a little bit of adjustment. I can try and I'm not going to say no more five guys. I'm going to say no more Chipotle. I'm not going to say never again. Am I going to have them say, okay, if I was consistently doing this almost every day, just by me simply only allowing it once a week or twice a week for me is a significant difference than what it was before. And my body will start to see change from that. So these are all things that I'm doing right now. Psychologically speaking, Easy. Which is which is a big, big part of this. A big part of this is that psychological component. Far more effective. I, I remember when I first became, I guarantee you guys did the same thing. When I first became a trainer, people would hire me and I'd throw everything at them right off mm-hmm. the bat. Oh, okay, you want to lose 30 pounds? Oh, agreed. Here's your meal plan. Here's your workout. This is how much cardio you're going to do. We're going to get you to lose 30 pounds. Mm-hmm. Super ineffective. Every once in a while, I get a client that would do it all, lose weight. They'd always gain it back. But it was super, super ineffective because ultimately, what are you asking yourself? If you right now are, are, are listening to this podcast and you're, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 pounds or more overweight, in order to lose that weight, you have to change things on a fundamental level to cause your body to, to adapt to lose 30 pounds or 40 pounds. It's, it's not going to go away with you not changing anything at my point. And so it, that's your life. Something about your life has to fundamentally change. Now, yeah. how on a scale of one to 10... How hard is it to fundamentally change things about your life? A 10. Mm-hmm. Everything. I don't care what you're doing. Anything. Look at your entire life. Think about something that you're going to fundamentally change. Your job, where I live, you know, my, my, you know, what I do all day long or what I do for fun. Just changing things that you do every single day, those are massive challenges. Right. They're big changes in your life. So what you're asking yourself to do is change your eating habits and your activity levels or activity habits fundamentally so that you no longer carry around this extra body fat. Well, that's a that's a big thing you're asking of yourself. So the approach should be this. You want to challenge yourself 
That's definitely important because if you don't challenge yourself, it's not going to be worth it. If this is easy, I promise you, you'll never... I mean, honestly, if there was a weight loss pill, you would see people gain the weight back too because it would be nothing. They'd take the pill, gain, lose the weight, and then gain it back and have mm-hmm. to keep taking the pill because there's nothing learned from it. There's no changes. So make it challenging so that you have to kind of push yourself a little bit and grow, but don't make it so challenging that you that it's not realistic for you to stay consistent with no, it. No, you say something all the time that I love is that you, you have to change your verbiage too, the way you look at it. It's like, I, I'm not doing this because I can't have these things. I'm doing it because I don't want to. And so I even look at it like that for going back to the examples of me, you know, taking the fries out or what that, well, I think it was just last week I had five guys in fries because why? Because I wanted it. Mm-hmm. I wanted it. And I also know that I had already strung together like four or five days in a row where I was eating really good. And then the way I stretch myself and I give myself challenges is I compete against myself. So, you know, uh, let's say the the best I've done right now is four days of like dialed in eating. And then I end up having something that's kind of off the menu that's not ideal for me. And I know that, but I'm okay with that. I'm choosing to do that. It's Friday night. We've been good all week. We trained earlier that day. Like this is still something that's been in my life for a while consistently. So I'm going to allow it. I'm going to enjoy it tonight with Katrina. Okay. Well, I've now strung four days in a row before a mishap has happened. Let's see if I can put five days. Let's see if I can put seven days. And I keep playing this game with myself of and then when I do it, I I, I look at and Katrina. Let's say Katrina comes home one night. And she goes, "Honey, I am just craving this." And I go, "Oh, I don't want I don't want to do that because I've already made it four days, and the most I've made is five. I want to get to six. And you or tell seven. yourself you don't want to. And I tell I don't want to. And then when that day six or seven comes around, chances are sometimes I don't even want to have it yet. And if I do, I've earned it. That's yeah, how yeah, I look at it, yeah. and I just keep piling but it's, onto that. But it's it's very individual. So if you're an, if you're a person who is struggling, uh, and this is very difficult for you. Your challenge is going to look very different from Adam's. Your challenge may literally be, you know, you ask yourself like, okay, I want to lose 30 pounds. All right. What am I what am I willing to do that's challenging, but I know I'm going to do consistently. Okay. And I think that's the biggest point because, you know, each individual, they understand themselves the best. And they understand whatever they can do that they can stick with and what those specifics are. Like what's the most mentally challenging I mean, when you start kind of scaling that back, okay, what's one thing I can do tomorrow? Right, right. Now add on to that. What's the second thing? Right. So let me third let me give you a scenario. I'll give you a a fake scenario that might help, right? So let's say, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay, I need to lose 30 pounds. You know, I'm unhealthy or whatever. I don't like the way I look. All right. So what can I do? And you write out a list. All right. I'm going to, you know, it says I should work out three days a week. Am am I willing to work out three days a week consistently and reliably? No, definitely not going to do that. Am I willing to work out two days a week? Hmm. Consistently? Let's see. I'm doing zero now. Mm-hmm. I have to wake up early because I go to work. So two days a week, I have to wake up You know, two hours early to work out. No, not going to do that. One day a week? No, not going to do that. Am I willing to park my car at the end of the parking lot for work? Yes, I'm willing to do that. Perfect. So every day, I'm going to park my car at the furthest part of the parking lot, and then I'm going to walk to work. So boom, that's what I'm going to do. What about nutrition? Okay, let me look at my diet. Am I willing to cut out sugar? Uh, you know, reliably? Ah, uh, no. I really, really like sugar. All right, am I willing to cut my sugar in half? I don't know. Okay, well, am I willing to cut sugar one day? Yes, I'm willing to do that. And so this is literally what you're doing with yourself. And this, by the way, this is a this is a strategy that psychologists have used for decades uh, to help people overcome some of these challenges. It's no different with new, with your with your weight and. Well, it's you know, like what Andrew Hill does with addiction. Mm. That's why I think that's why I thought it was so fascinating the way they mm-hmm. he's t- treating d- drug and alcohol addiction. I thought we the way we've treated drug and alcohol addiction for so long is so backwards thinking of this. Take an addict who's been doing it forever, Dude, and then you demonize your, it and take it away from him and say never ever again. It's like it's yeah. your body. It's you. It's so you figured this out for yourself, and that's what's so effective. It could literally be this. It could even be this. Like, you know what? I'm so lazy. I'm not willing to do anything. Uh, most things to help me lose weight. Am I willing to read a book on better nutrition? Yes, I'm, I'm willing to do that. Cool, that's what I'm going to do. I mean, that's it. Yeah. Literally, literally so, so my point with this is the best way to lose belly fat or the best way to lose fat, it's, it's on you. It's yeah. you. And the best way to do it is challenge yourself enough, but challenge yourself with things you could do consistently. Mm-hmm. And when you prove yourself you could do that, then you progress to the next level. And you have to, to be level. insanely honest with yourself. Yes. Like you can't be swayed by what people expect of you or who tells you something and advice. Like You literally have to evaluate all of these things 
and be insanely honest with yourself that you're going to stick to this. You're going to, you're going to make this happen. Dude, and it's something that's actionable. I had a client that had over a hundred pounds to lose. I trained her years ago, three years. I trained her. She lost 20 pounds in three years. Okay. That's pretty fucking slow fat loss, especially when you have a hundred pounds to lose. But the following year, she lost 80, well, I think 70 pounds or something like that. She almost lost all of the weight in that final year, but it took her three years just to lose the first 20. This same lady now, we're talking years later, and by the way, the statistics on someone losing that much weight and the, the statistics on them gaining it back is- it's, 85. It's, it's horrible. Most people gain it back. Yeah. She hasn't gained it back. Not only has she not gained it back, she's fitter, far fitter than she was before. So there, there's just an, an easy example. Next question is from Hunter Given. What is the healthiest way to bulk? What types of carbs should you consume? Healthiest way to bulk. Uh, well, let's start with the unhealthiest ways to bulk. <laughs> the ways I used to bulk. I used to... Weight gainer 5,000. I used to get my body weight routinely. I would do this every year. I did this for years. Every winter-ish, or I should say post-summer, I would be like, time to get big, and I would eat as much as humanly possible. I would take weight gainer shakes. I would pound my mouth with food. Um, I would take all the supplements and I would get my body weight. Now, gra granted- It's like the grizzly bear approach, dude, right? You're going into hibernation. Yeah, if you look at me now, I'm, I'm six foot. I'm anywhere between 186 to 192 pounds. Relatively muscular, relatively lean. I'm not like this massive big dude. I don't have this huge frame, right? I used to, I used to get my body weight up to 230 every year. 230 pounds. So that's an additional 40 plus pounds on my body. Jacked. And, You're just and, packing it on. And let me tell you. Jacked. And let me tell you. <laughs> you look badass. Yeah. Most yeah. of it was not muscle. <laughs> Thick right? neck. I'm trying oh. to convince him to go back yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Come on, bro. Terrible. terrible. Come on, terrible. bro. And I would eat. Getthick.com. I would stuff my face. I'd eat, 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 eat until I got so sick of food. And then summertime would come around. And then I'd do this massive cut where I'd drop 30 to 40 pounds and then I'd repeat the next year and every year I'd never really progressed it was always back and front back and forth back and forth I wasn't like this every year I'm getting a little bit of progress type of deal and that was a very unhealthy way to bulk and I guarantee you that that I'm sure played a role in some of my gut issues by just stuffing myself with food and causing inflammation and all these other things mm -hmm. which then later on made it impossible to bulk right because uh, my, my gut could no longer handle uh, you know pushing the food in so Unhealthy way to bulk is just eating anything and everything uh, and then counting every pound on the scale as good weight. Uh, such a good point right yeah, there. Because I, I think I over overcomplicated this for many, many years because of what you just said right there. But I was the skinny kid who couldn't put any muscle on. Building, bulking was so difficult for me that I was so attached to the, what the scale would say every night before I went to bed and every morning when I woke up, and that was what dictated how I ate the next day. And it, I should have known better. I knew the science, but for some reason I felt, which is why I think we speak so passionately about this because we know that I know I understand the science and I still fell victim of being a, a slave to the scale where I was allowing it to give me the feedback on what, how I should be eating and training the next day. So I think people don't realize if you if you're if you got a killer program that you're following so that would be the the healthiest way to bulk the first thing i would tell you is to, to get on a program send the right signal right exactly send send the right signal get in a solid program and make sure you're you're following that because if you are scaling it correctly if you're phasing it correctly the body will adapt and change it does not take that much extra calories for it to respond and start to build muscle. So, and that is, I didn't think that way before. It was all a calorie game for me before. It was not, I was not looking at my programming as much as I would, I would lean towards programming now. Like My so. programming followed my diet. Like if I, if I got stronger, oh cool, then I'm going to lift heavier. But it was never like, look at my program. I want to gain. How should I train? Right. Yeah. Exactly. So I think that's the, I think if you're feeding the body what it needs, if you're hitting your, your minimum targets as far as proteins and fats and carbohydrate intake for what your body needs and your programming is on point, majority of people's bodies will respond and they'll be able to bulk up. Now, the I think the way I did it in the past is kind of the lazy way or the way that everybody else seems to be doing it, which is just put on as much weight and give. And it's easy because it justifies the excuse to eating all this shit food. It's like, I'm on the bulk, bro. 
Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm on the bulk. That's why I'm eating this way. Like, duh. You know what I'm saying? It's hard <laughs> yes. for it's hard for me to gain weight. Like, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. And, but what would your on on days like that when you're really bulking hard? What would your day look like food wise? Calories? Yeah. No. Like, what would you eat throughout oh, the day? Oh my god. So I, there. Okay. Yeah. I'll tell you. I'll run it. I think I did this on the podcast a long time ago. Yeah. No. I want to hear it. This again. was a a a, I'll tell you mine. a staple mm-hmm. day for me for years. I would I would first wake up in the morning. I would have four Eggo waffles, right? Great old Eggo waffles with oh, yeah. peanut butter. Throw all the toaster. Yeah, a, yeah, a couple tablespoons of peanut butter smeared all over them and then real maple syrup. And then I would wash it down with my first Rockstar. And I'd have that on the way to work. As soon as I got to work, then across the street, we had this little bagel donut place. And so then I go over there and I get this ham, egg, cheese, croissant, another Rockstar, and a glazed donut. And then I would I would come back to the gym. So this is all within the first hour and a half of my day. This is this is what I would do. <laughs> and then I I wouldn't be hungry until after my workout. I used to work out on lunch around noon or one. And then I'd have one or two, depending on how big of a bulk I'm on or how big of how much weight I'm pushing or if I was taking testosterone. I would have a quiz large Quiznos or second Quiznos sandwich plus chips and a, and a drink. Then after that, I, I would finally eat the one meal that I probably prepared for myself, would be, which would be a staple chicken and rice and broccoli type of meal. And I'd have that- The healthy meal? Yeah. I'd have one or two <laughs> like these he- quote unquote healthier meals, right? Yeah. Like that, that were actually prepared uh, before I leave work. I'd leave work around 6 to 8 p.m. at night. On the way home, I'd swing into McDonald's. I'd get a number one plus an extra Big Mac and a 20-piece McNugget. And that was- uh, a long that's a calorie bomb right there. Oh yeah, no, that's that's what I ate for a very very long time to maintain. And it was tough dude because I was moving a lot. I mean, I was training 10 12 clients a day, so I was burning a fuck ton of calories. I was training hard and heavy every day, 7 days a week, plus I was playing pickup ball every now and then. You know, then. The, the interesting thing would be it's let's if we were to count all that up and look at the calories and macros, right? I wonder if you ate the same amount of calories and macros but you ate foods that were not fast food and not processed and stuff like that. I wonder if it would have made an impact. Oh, I believe that my personal belief is that I could have ate significantly less, but healthier choices of calories. And and I would have seen as much gains as far as building muscle. Because a lot of what I built, and I think that when you're a guy who has a, a skinny complex, and you see your shirts filling out, and you're putting the scale is going up. All things are good, man. Yeah. I'm heading the right direction. Beefcake. But when I when I really started to get into like breaking down like how much my body fat percentage is and how much I lose, like it, real quick, it w- was it opened my eyes. That, oh my god, I'm putting 20 pounds on. But you know, twelve of it is body fat, eight of it is muscle. Oh, I used to do. I used to hate that. So right. I test my body fat. I'm like fuck. Right. Yeah. And then you go the other direction, and you and you lean out, and I cut. Well, we cut Pinch hard, an inch. and then out of twenty pounds, I lose. You know, all twenty pounds that I need to lose, and I end up losing almost all. Maybe one pound of muscle stayed on me, you know, or maybe two pounds. Which of muscle. Which is like user error on the body fat. Right. Test. Right. It's like <laughs> yeah, I yeah. I I bulked up this hard. I put all this weight on just so I could actually net. One to two pounds of, of, of which if, which, muscle. Which the, the funny thing is, one to two pounds of muscle is good, right? right? That's a good gain. But if you just changed your exercise programming where it was better, you probably wouldn't have to change anything about your diet and you'd gain one or two pounds. You know I what I'm saying? I agree. And, and by the way, if you're disagreeing with me and you're listening right now, Here's here's your little thought experiment. Oh, fuck, I'll take the Pepsi Channel yeah. all day. Try the program. Run one of our programs for three months and do that. I'll yeah. fucking give your money yeah. back. Well, here's here's out. here's here's my here's my thought experiment. Take somebody who's just lifting weights and they're eating whatever they're eating, and it's like ah, oh, I can't gain a single pound. Don't increase their calories at all. Don't change anything. Put them on steroids. Watch them. Watch what happens. All of a sudden, they can build muscle. Well, what does that tell you? That tells you that all they need is the signal. Now with steroids, it's a hormonal signal. Well. Forget steroids for a second. You can send the right signal with resistance training. And so changing your programming will yield you more muscle. And more muscle doesn't take a pound of muscle a week. Like, let's say you gained a pound of fucking muscle a week. That's a that's a, that's a lot. Yeah. You're kicking ass. You're like, going to see that. Dude, you're crushing. Three yeah. months, you put on, what, 8, 12 pounds of lean body mass? Like, you're killing it. A pound of muscle, theoretically, is how many extra grams of protein and calories... That we, would your body need to build that, right? That's like an extra, I don't know, five grams of protein a day, 10 grams of protein a day, maybe. If your body, and, and what happens when you train properly is, yeah, it's 100 grams of protein 
uh, divide that board by you know seven you know seven days, and what does that turn into? Right? It's not not a ton of it's not a ton more protein, um, especially if you do it over the course of you know if you start to calculate it over the months. It's not a ton more protein. Plus, as you train and send the right signal, your body changes how it uses protein. So it's, you don't even necessarily need the extra protein. Your body becomes more efficient with its protein, where more of it goes is becomes dedicated to muscle building and recovery, and less of it gets dedicated to being used for calories. So right. I, I'll, I'll give you one of my days. So what I what I and so I had two uh, actually there were two cycles of bulking that I've done, and one of them was I would wake up in the morning, and I'd have between six to six to eight whole eggs with cheese. So I'd scramble that and a half a box. It's a regular box of Cheerios, half of the box with whole milk. That was breakfast, so, <laughs> right? Then in between breakfast and lunch, I would have a seven to, 700 to 900 calorie weight gainer shake, which I would just pound. Um, and sometimes if I was feeling really like motivated, I'd throw in a protein bar with that at the same time. Then lunch would usually consist of some type of insane amount of fast food. Whether it was a bucket of chicken from you know KFC, or it was <laughs> I'd go to McDonald's and get the ninety nine cent you know cheeseburger and I'd I'd get like seven of them you know I'd be like fuck I'm eat seven cheeseburgers <laughs> so it'd be an insane amount. Then between lunch and dinner I'd have another one of those weight gainer shakes and then for dinner I'd have around a pound of some kind of meat and I'd have a couple big ass bowls of pasta and this is how I'd get my body weight up to two hundred thirty pounds of wonderfully attractive squishiness. You, uh, you must have been like just smelling it up, man. Bro, I was... Uh, Dropping bombs. Oh, you know what, dude? I did not know this at the time, but, uh, you know, yes, I know, you, you know, farts come out of your, your butthole and all that stuff. Right. They're not supposed They're not supposed to be super putrid smelling. I thought all <laughs> farts, you know what I mean? I'm like, oh yeah, it's a fart. Uh, you, no, know, you know the difference in, uh, especially when you're, when you have to go through like these weight rooms, like uh, <laughs> with like big ass dudes, like every now and then you'll, you'll get somebody to drop one of those protein, you know, super like. I mean, they're eating way too much food type of <laughs> smelling farts. It it literally knocks everybody out. Dude. You can't even stomach it. Dude, I got I got in like a major like argument with my ex-wife when we were married because I would just bust ass and then it would just, it was heavy and just really bad. And we get these big old fights about <laughs> and it. And it like, lingers. It doesn't go away. And my it's, argument was like, it's a fart. It's supposed to smell. Yeah, hey, it's a fart. She was right. Sorry. No. Next question is from more JoJo. A body-positive, intuitive eating advocate argued that it is not important that people know portion size or know how certain foods affect the body and mind. What are your thoughts on the extreme body-positive advocates who seem to encourage body acceptance with no regard to healthy habits? How do you see health education fitting into intuitive eating? Mm. Somebody asked a question similar to this that I had never, and they, 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 on the Q and A, they had put the hashtag there too, and it had something to do with this organization that is similar to what I think this. They might be talking about the same thing right here. I never had heard of this, but it's mm. what we've discussed before. With there's this learning to love your body and love yourself, and then there's this like using that as an excuse, yeah, to not, not. Uh, Address do the due diligence as far as like understanding, uh, you know, the amount of calories you're consuming, the macronutrients, and like just educating yourself. Here's the deal like, once I think the, the medical standard for technically obesity is if we're carrying 20 or 30 pounds of body fat extra than our, our body frame should have on us, and, and a bunch, over 65% of the, the country is in that place, and over 80% of the country is overweight. And here's the deal like. I don't care how the fuck you draw this up. Like, if you're if you're that overweight or more, which most people are, it's a reflection of your eating habits. It's not like a reflection of your character. You know what I'm saying? This doesn't mean you're a bad person because you. Eat it, but it does mean you're not taking care of your fucking vessel. I don't give a shit how you draw it up. And so, I think the education around eating, eating, and understanding what's doing your body is extremely important, especially if you think you're going to be. An intuitive eater. If you're going to coach and tell people they should be intuitively eating, which I think is like the fucking black belt of fucking nutrition, like you, I, I don't even believe I'm there. Yeah, how the fuck would you tell someone to intuitively eat without them knowing about food and how it affects their body? Like, what you're basically telling someone to do is to eat blind or non-intuitive or unaware eating. 
yeah. is what you're asking people to do. So that makes no sense. Here's the thing with body acceptance. Uh, first off, body image and self-image, two completely different things. So Adam touched on about your character. You can objectively, you know, look in the mirror and say, okay, I'm, I have excess body fat or my body reflects my poor eating habits and my lack of activity. But you, and at the, in the same breath, you can say, I love myself. I love myself and I'm a good person. Right. Now, here's the deal. I've heard people say this before, by the way. I've had people, I've gotten in debates and arguments where people were like, I don't need to work out. I don't need to watch what I eat. I love my body. <clears throat> That's not true. That's the wrong answer. In fact, what you're actually demonstrating is you don't love your body. You really don't. So to say you love your body and then go around and not take care of your body, like, how do you take, let me ask you a question. How do you take care of things you care about? Like if you care about your car, I really love my car. How do you take it? You get a car washed, you get it detailed, make sure it doesn't get dinged up. You get to keep the inside organized and clean. You get the oil changed. How do you treat a car when you don't give a shit about it? You, you don't care. You don't wash it. You don't care about the inside. You don't get the oil changed. You, the, the light comes on on, the, on your dash. You ignore it. So how does somebody who cares about their body in a true sense, who really loves their body, and I don't mean accept because acceptance is important too. You don't want to fight reality. I don't want to, you know, look in the mirror and be like, ah, you know, this is not me. Like, yeah, accept your body. There's nothing wrong with that. Of course, you have to accept things and accept reality. But how would you treat yourself if you truly loved yourself? If you really, truly loved yourself. And what I mean by that is if you took care of yourself like you took care of somebody that you cared about, would that include eating a lot of foods that aren't necessarily good for you? Would it include not being active? Would it include you know, poor health habits, you know, on a daily basis? Of course not. Well, That's there, not what caring about your body looks yeah. like in the truest sense. There's a massive difference between cravings and, and real hunger, right, too. So, like, how do you even decipher whether or not, like, if your body's telling you, I want to eat this, and you're just listening to your body, how do you know that that's the right thing? Yeah. You, You've you, never even understood that Listen, yet. intuitive. Yeah. we've said it since day one, since we put out the intuitive eating guide, and even before we put the guide out, we talked about this for a long time in Mind Pump, that the ultimate goal, obviously, is to get to intuitive eating and intuitive training. The ultimate goal is to not have to feel like you always need this like rigorous like structure just to get you to be healthy and in shape. But the bottom line is, it's, it's necessary that you learn some of this in order to do that. You can't just expect to do that. I mean, there's there's a lot of steps along the way of getting to the point to where you can intuitively <laughs> eat. I was just thinking of like <laughs> like Wim Hof, right? He does like these superhuman crazy things. Like he'll just go jump in like freezing water, right? And it's almost like, oh, I'm just going to go jump in freezing water. Yeah. Yeah. I have no idea how to understand how to regulate my body in order to handle that type well, of a stress and situation. Take it another step. Let's say let's say you've never played tennis in your entire life, maybe never even seen it, and uh, you're at a you know tennis game or whatever, and people are like, "Hey, go pick up a racket and play tennis." You're like, cool. I'm gonna go intuitively play tennis. <laughs> okay, yeah. you're gonna fucking suck. You're yeah. not even gonna know the rules. You have no idea what tennis is. So how can you even now take it another step further? Let's say you took it seriously and you're like, okay. I need to learn the rules of tennis. I need to learn what the ball is. I need to know what the score is. I need to know what the, you know, how to serve. I'm going to have someone teach me. I'm going to, and then you play tennis a lot and you practice and you practice and practice. And eventually you get so good that you can play intuitively. And right. eventually it's in your subconscious. Eventually the ball, the ball comes at you and you know how to swing at it or you know how to react or you watch the ball coming at you, you know where it's going to go and where it's going to bounce and how it's going to move. That's the intuitive part that you can reach with with nutrition, but there's no way to get there if you don't understand the fundamentals. If you don't know how your body, first of all, if you don't know what hunger is, which most of you don't, who are listening, 100%, you all know cravings, I, I know that, but you definitely don't know hunger. If you haven't gone longer than 24 or 48 hours without food, you don't know what hunger is. What you do know is cravings, and cravings are connected to emotions, they're, correct, they're, they're connected to settings, and they're connected to the, the people that are around you. So when you're with your friends and you have a craving, it's usually I'm sad, happy, excited, anxious, whatever, or I'm in this environment and in this environment, you know, I'm in Mexico, so Mexican food sounds really good. Or I'm with these friends and we're enjoying ourselves. And that's what drives our, our, our typically you know, our food choices. And of course, everything goes into that, right? What the food tastes like and all that stuff. So you can't, that's not hunger, that's craving. So that's number one. Number two, you don't know what's in food. Not only do you not know what's in food, 
But take another step further. You don't know what you eat. You have no idea. Ask yourself, how many grams of protein do I eat every single day? I guarantee you'll get it wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, ask yourself how many calories you eat every day. You're, 100% you're going to get it wrong. So how can you intuitively eat if you don't even know the rules of the game? You don't even know what the game looks like. You have no idea. You're just floating around, listening to cravings, eating whatever's there, whatever feels good. And it's arguably one of the most complex games. It, pff, I would 100% agree with that. Right. When you talk about when you talk about the mind and the body, dude, you're talking about two yeah. of the we we are so we're learning so much still about that just collectively as a yeah. society and then in addition to that, there's such an individual variance with so many people. So it's probably one of the most complex games that you can learn to play. So to, to be ignorant and to think that you're going to step on the court, and I guess we'll use tennis. I don't know why you went that way. For <laughs> well, because I think it makes sense. <laughs> it, yeah. it, it, it All sports do, right? Yeah, so yeah, any, yeah. any sport does. I thought it was cute that tennis you Tennis was on the mind. Yeah, I was like, yeah. did you play tennis yeah, lately yeah. or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Were, you, were you watching tennis? To love. Love, love. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't know what that means. So but the I only, agree. yes, yeah. I have no love idea. Love means zero. Yeah, oh, sorry. So and here's the other part of this, this body acceptance. You know, I'm all about uh, being positive about your self-image, your body image. I'm also very uh, a strong advocate of reality. So positive. So let me give you an example. Let's say, let's say you know you have a friend who has a tragic tragic accident and they they lose their legs. They lose their legs in a, in a car accident and they're depressed about it. And they come to you and they're like, "I'm fucking depressed, man." You're like, "Well, what's going on?" Well, I can't. I can't walk. You know, I'm, I'm stuck in this wheelchair. I can't walk and I, I can't run anymore. And then I tell them, oh, yes, you can. You've got legs. Everything's great. Like, they're going to be like, what the fuck are you talking about, dude? That's not reality. Instead, I could say, you're right. You're, you're right. You, you know lost what? your legs. But here's what we can do. Here are the things we can do. So when you're looking at yourself and you're, you know, you want to be positive, it's also good. To, it's also extremely important to be objective. So you can say to yourself, I'm 30 pounds overweight. My body reflects poor health. However... I love myself. Instead of the false body positive thing where it's like, I'm beautiful. I think I'm great. I'm, I'm healthy. I can move. I'm great. No, that's not true. You're probably not. Your health probably isn't as good as it could be. Mm-hmm. You know you can't move that well because you get tired of getting in and out of your car. You know you're not treating yourself well. Like It's okay to be honest, well, and, but it's not okay to not And how yourself. devastating is it for that person who's been told this or has been practicing this mantra for a while, and then they go see their doctor five years later, and he goes, oh, by the way, you have diabetes. <laughs> right. But wait, I'm so healthy and beautiful yeah, I've been and positive I've been, the, like, for the what? last three years. This can't be possible. Like yeah, yeah. I've been intuitive eating and I love myself more than I've ever... No, get the fuck out of here. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds <laughs> yeah, me when you yeah, said, yeah. like how I, th- I think a great analogy is like when you brought up... Uh, I remember one time when on the podcast, we were talking about how you don't tell your son he's smart. And I thought, oh, that was really interesting. Like, yeah. why wouldn't you say that to him? And you actually had a an incredible point why you don't. You don't want him to identify with that because no. one day he's going to run. Because he is very smart. He is, right? Yeah. Right. I, that's why I said that that was crazy. I'm like, he is a very smart kid. Why wouldn't you tell him that? And it's like, well, because I don't want him to identify with that. So then when he gets older and he, fuck, maybe he's someone smarter than him or he has a hard time with that, he doesn't collapse yeah. and fall apart because my daddy told me I was fucking smart. Yep. The same thing goes for the fat girl. I mean, you've been sitting here sitting in front of the mirror all the time telling about how great you look and your body image is awesome and I'm beautiful. I'm so sexy and this and that. You keep t- and then all of a sudden the doctor slaps on you. Oh, you got diabetes you got your fucking you got this blocked up you got this going on with you and you look all dumbfounded like you don't have no idea why well it's because you think you've been loving yourself but you really haven't no you're hating yourself Mm. body image totally different from self-image self-image it's important you care about yourself and a and when you truly do care about yourself through your self-image then the body image starts to your objective body image that starts to change because your body will start to change you can work your way up that's what it's all about agassi yeah you know what i mean the best of Seb. I am an assistant fitness director at my club and am very passionate at what I do. My managers, on the other hand, aren't. My fitness director is very egotistical and only enjoys her title. My GM is unmotivated and isn't willing to do anything to improve the club. Our numbers are horrible and my team hates it here. What steps can we take to change our numbers, staff attitude, and club future? Yeah. Be the change, man. Yeah, yes. be the change that you want. So if you're if you're in a position of assistant fitness director, director, you have a certain level of uh, control in the sense that you can probably call meetings or maybe do trainings uh, one on one. You're in charge of the weekend. You're you're in charge yeah, of something, yeah. right? So what I recommend is take control. And so maybe have a conversation with your fitness director and be like, hey, 
you know what I'd love to do? I'd love to on Monday, I'd love to offer a free, you know, sales training course to some of the trainers. You know, how do you feel about that? Now, for the most part, I would assume that the fitness director or the GM would be like, yeah, I don't, that's cool. I don't care about that. Now, if they say no and they don't allow you to do your job, this is a totally different conversation. But if they let you do these things that are going to probably make them more money too, start doing that. Start becoming the leader in the gym and yep. organize these people. Maybe take the best trainer you know who's good at correctional exercise and go up to them and say, hey, look, you're the best person in the gym at correctional exercise. Would you like to teach a class on a correctional exercise? And then maybe go to the best salesperson. Maybe that's not you. Maybe it's someone else and be like, hey, would you mind teaching you know, a group of us trainers how to sell better uh, you know, on this particular day and organize that? And then maybe you do role playing with other trainers. And then maybe you go out on the workout floor and you start implementing new change and ideas. And you slowly become the leader of the movement in that gym. And you do it in a very positive way you know, fun, awesome way. And then before you know it, you become the fitness director or the, or the GM. It's usually the, the, the direction it goes. I'm going to, I'm going to challenge this person a little bit first to look at themselves too. One, uh, great book along these lines. And I think I've mentioned it a long time ago on the show. Uh, John C. Maxwell's 360 leader, I think is a great read for this situation right here because it, it discusses what it's like trying to become a leader or be a leader in middle management, which is exactly where you're at right now. So that, I think that's a great read. Uh, it was one of those game changers for me when I was going through a very similar situation. Now, the self-reflection piece that I'm going to give you is that, one, you're an assistant you're assistant fitness manager or, or club manager, whatever, right now. And sometimes when we're in our position, it's really easy to look at upper management and companies and owners and VPs and CEOs and be like, I can't believe they're not doing this and I would this and then well listen you're not there for a reason you know you haven't built you you didn't build a multi-million dollar company up you didn't build a, a business that has 2,000 workouts every single day and can staff 30 employees and so there's a lot more to it than maybe the decisions that you think need to be made or should be done so you know a little self-reflection on yourself and and what you can be doing right now is growing and developing as a leader and be and being the best at what you currently do. And so what I would do for myself and what I did in this exact situation was I'm going to work so hard at being the best at my position and, and what I do that I will gain attention and respect from my peers. And that's how I started. I started with, you know, being competitive with myself and saying, okay, you know, I can be the best within my facility. And then when I became the best in my facility, I'm like, I can be the best in my area. And when I was the best in my area, I can be one of the best in the company. And so I was pushing myself because I 100% believe in speed of the leader, especially in, in, in a business like this, to gain the respect of your peers. You've got to be doing something that they can't they can't currently do for them to probably seek out education and information from you. Otherwise, you're just a glorified fucking assistant manager who got a title because they think you're an ass yeah, kisser, yep, which yep. is probably what most people think. And it's unfortunate, but that's just how this works. Yeah. And so Great I wouldn't points. I wouldn't let mm -hmm. the title get on my head as far as like trying to get these guys, telling these guys what to do. If I'm not kicking so much ass that people aren't asking me questions, most of the work needs to be done there. Yeah. If yeah. I'm not at a point, point, if I have not you know, came in that place and made myself known as like, like I would go in and this is my club. I'm a trainer. I even before I was even an assistant. But not because you're telling everybody what to no, do. No, not but because you're the best no. one. Right. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to impact my facility. So much more powerful. Yeah, you just command respect that right. way. Right. Yeah. So for much of my career, um, and I haven't talked a lot about this, but for much of my career, I actually trained the other side of the house, right? So uh, the, the sales side. Um, as a fitness instructor or somebody that you are, like you don't, you're not responsible for the GM and the sales side. Well, in my club, I was, and the reason why I was was because I was known as the best. I was the best salesman. I was the best trainer, and I was the one who was communicating with my members the most. I was the one communicating with the staff and helping people out the most. And when you start to you 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 start to create yourself as the authority without even needing a title, you don't need that. And so, I would push myself if I'm you to become that guy or girl first where my st the staff around me, the people around me are wanting to know, what am I doing? What is he doing to be so successful? That now leads me an opportunity 
to lead and teach and then to tell them what I think. But if they don't respect your opinion right now, well, instead of like saying they're dumb or maybe they don't know better, this, that, maybe look at yourself. Well, what am I not doing that hasn't got their attention that they don't even want to ask? I, I would I would carry a little chip yeah, on my shoulder. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I, honestly, I don't have much to contribute to that other than, you know, like if you want their attention, obviously you're going to want to do something significant. And it, literally they will change by asking you questions at some point. So that that's really the feedback that you want is for them to approach you as opposed to like, you, you trying. That? Yeah, and it, that that just makes so much more change, right? Uh, versus the the opposite, which yeah, it, it will sort of turn into that position where um, you, there's going to be quarrel amongst people as mm-hmm. to why you got you're right. moving well, up. And you know, I, I feel for this person because yeah. uh, depending on the situation, you know, um, I've worked. I had one district manager when, uh, so when I grand opened uh, Santa Teresa, the, the club there, one of the managers that I had, the district managers I had was, for the most part, I always had great uh, people that I worked under. And what I mean by that is either they, you know, I was able to be mentored by them in some way, or they just left me alone, which was the best thing you could possibly do. Because if mm-hmm. you left me alone and let me do my thing, I would kill it. I would crush. It wouldn't be a problem. But I had one. I had one district manager who was, I mean, just pure garbage, just completely inadequate as a manager, terrible leader. And and this is the kind of guy he would show up into my gym and he would think that he was doing training with my staff and they would hide. They'd be like, Sal, tell me something to do. Like, he's going to crap me out. I'm not going to be able to sell today or I'm not going to be able to train today. Like, He's there, and he'd, or he'd give these meetings and, and then the whole staff would leave and guess would have to give another meeting to get everybody back on track, Sal. So he'd have a meeting, he'd leave, I'd call another meeting, everybody back in here because everybody's so crapped out about the shitty <laughs> meeting they just had with, mm. with this district manager. From negative Nancy. He was fucking terrible. Just a terrible leader. Nobody respected him. He'd show up and he used to try and find reasons to fuck with me. At one point he wrote me up because I... I highlighted the master appointment book in a way he didn't like. In other words, I underlined things with highlighter. No, 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 no. You need to fill in the whole thing with highlighter. Strike it. And he actually wrote me up for this, which I thought was, even though I was saving highlighters, that's why I was trying to do that. I'm like, I'm going through fucking packs of highlighters. The company's spending a fortune on this bullshit. (laughs) And and the pages are all wet and shit. Let me just underline it. It's the same fucking thing. I actually got a write-up for that. So anyway, this guy's was so much garbage that I I couldn't stand it. But then he went on vacation and that's when I seized my opportunity because when he went on vacation, he put me in charge of the district. And when he put me in, and the hard thing was, how do I get this across to his manager? Because it's a hard thing to do, right? It's hard to go above your manager to the next manager and be like, hey, listen, this guy sucks. Now I had a lot of clout because I'd been in the company a little while and I was a good performer, but still you kind of sound like a, a, a crybaby or you sound like a, like you got to be careful with that, right? Like, why are you complaining? Right? So I waited, had my opportunity. He went on vacation and just like Adam was saying, I was like, I'm going to fucking, I'm, cause I'm in charge of the district while he's gone. I'm going to make this shit happen. And what I'm going to do it so well that the VP who's his boss is going to be like, why the fuck isn't this happening when so-and-so was in town? Why is it happening now? And that's exactly what I did. He he left. I fucking took over the district. We crushed it. Everybody was happy. The reports were like, this is the fucking greatest you know, week of whatever. And the dude eventually well, I remember had to get demoted. T- I remember, too, that when you get a, an assistant position like this in, in our facilities back when we were in clubs forever ago, um, I uh, you would be in charge of the weekend, right? So if you're an assistant, uh, the assistant fitness manager, the assistant GM, they manage the weekends. That was like that was part of the assistant's job. And so my goal always was, which by the way, in, in our like the gym that I was from, you know, Saturdays and Sundays always underperformed Monday through Friday. But that's I don't typical, right? Right, that's typical. But I didn't believe in that. I believed it underperformed because we all believed it underperformed, and because there was no energy or effort put into the weekends, and everybody left work by three o'clock in the afternoon. But what if somebody actually fucking grinded it out like a 10 to 12 hour day like we did on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday? Like, what if I grinded out? What if I actually structured a ton of employ- uh, uh, appointments on that day more than what we had on the following Monday? Like, what if I took charge of this is all I got? I've only got two days, and I've got to show that I can build a business in these two days better than my boss and my boss's boss can. Like, that's how you get attention that way. I mean, you it has nothing to do with them. Like, I used to do the same thing. Your fitness director's not going to yeah. tell you you can't work a long day on Saturday, or he's not going to tell you 
you can't book a bunch of free appointments. They're not going to tell you you can't make the weekend better, which they're probably too lazy to even come in and do. Are you kidding me? Like that's your opportunity. And then I tell you what, if those days, if Saturdays and Sundays start outperforming weekdays, somebody, some smart person is going to look up and go like, what the fuck is going on there? Like, and guess who's the next fucking fitness manager? Right, manager. 100%. And then at the very minimum, your peers are going to get, and this is what happened to me because it took about six months before I was the top guy. You know, and everyone sees this guy who's 20 years old, who's crushing everybody in revenue. It didn't take long for all my peers to come over and be like, hey, hey, what are you doing, man? What are you, what are you saying in your prezo that people are doing this? And then they, now these instead of me being like, I'm the boss, or I'm assistant or whatever, sit down, let me teach you, even though you're 10 years older than me. I didn't tell anybody anything. I just did my thing and I did it better than everybody until everybody started to come to me and say, Hey man, what are you doing? And now I have an opportunity to lead. You turn turn the weekends into strong ends. That's right. You remember that? Yeah. Remember that <laughs> <laughs> Back in the day. Oh shit. Yeah. So check this out. Um, show notes. If you go to mindpumpmedia.com and go into the podcast um, tab, all episodes have show notes. So we have links to the studies we talk about. It tells you, you know, minute by minute what we talk about, so you can fast forward or rewind, uh, you know, based on what you want to hear. Um, and there's links to our, our promos and affiliates and all that stuff. Mindpumpmedia.com. Go to the podcast tab. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.